Hi everyone, this is Michael Gibbs. I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Architects and welcome to the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate 2022 free full AWS course. We're gonna try and make this a really great experience for you. Um, by the end of this course, you'll be well prepared for the AWS Solution Architect certification, but we're also gonna try and give you some more, more information to help better prepare you for your career because we really want you to build the best cloud computing career ever. And that's the reason we're doing this free AWS certification training. In fact, we make free AWS courses for the following reasons. I've been an architect now for over 25 years. And let me tell you, it is the absolute best job in the world. And when we look around, we see a lot of certification training that's focused on the name of the service and how to configure it. But as an architect, we're end to end system designers. So I want to give you a lot more architectural knowledge throughout the certification training program. So we can help you build the best cloud architect career. We'll give you AWS career tips. We're gonna provide some real cloud architect training while we're doing the certification training materials. I'm real excited. I'm gonna be here with Alonzo Coleman. Alonzo Coleman, who you can see on the left side of the screen is a fantastic cloud architect. And because this is a live training, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna teach the course in the following manner because we wanna get as close as possible to the actual live classroom. So you can have the absolute best AWS Solution Architect certification training experience. So we're gonna do as follows. We'll present for approximately 40 minutes per hour. Of course, we'll take maybe 20 minutes at a time, and then we'll do approximately 20 minutes of questions. So we can answer some of your questions. We'll answer as many as we can. What's gonna happen is my team is gonna go out there they're gonna collect questions, they're gonna aggregate the questions and they're gonna feed them to Alonzo and I and we're gonna answer them. So we'll answer as many questions as we can. Now understand everyone when we're running this AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate course, we're doing it live. And anything can happen with live, we can run into an internet service connection, service provider connection issue, we could run into something that's not behaving the way we absolutely would desire it to, but that's the nature of going live. But we're doing this live for the following reasons. Good solution architect training when you would take a course of several thousand dollars for the class for the week. We want you to get that classroom-like experience. I don't want anybody to just have the experience of watch some videos and be stuck. So we're going to have fun. So if you guys are ready to have fun, if you can put hashtag cloud hired in the chat box, I'm going to know that you're here. It looks like I've got people coming from Saudi Arabia, all over the U.S., Scotland, Spain. I see some people in India. I know a lot of people in Africa all, all ready to go uh, that I see on here. Lots of folks in India, Pakistan, Asia. What a great experience it is to have so many of you folks with us. So please type hashtag cloud hired in the box. If you're not one of our subscribers, please subscribe to this channel. We're going to do a free CCNA class next week. I've got executive recruiters from IT Excel coming on Friday to help you get cloud architect hired. So we're going to have a lot of really good free things and initiatives for you. Tonight, because Facebook has recently had a BGP configuration issue, and I've been teaching BGP for almost 25 years, I'm going to do an intro to BGP lecture at 5.30 Eastern, 2.30 Pacific time, and 10.30 UK time. So if you can join us, please do so. BGP training is typically something I reserve for my inner students because it's so critical to build a cloud architect career. But you know what? There was a massive outage. People are concerned and curious about, you know, what is BGP? So we're going to give you a real experience with it tonight. You need it to be a great cloud architect anyway, so we're going to have fun with it. BGP. So let's get you guys cloud hired. Let's get you guys cloud architect certified. Let's help you build the best cloud computing career. With that, we're going to start the training. Now, the way, way we're going to do the training is as follows. We are going to cover a service, and we're going to cover it from an industrial perspective first. See, a real cloud architect doesn't, doesn't know that S3 is object storage. They know object storage. And we're going to give you the survival skills to survive in any cloud while we try and do this. See, here's the thing. You learn to drive a car. You don't learn to drive a Mercedes and then go back to separate school to learn how to drive a BMW and then go to another school to learn how to drive a Honda and another one to be able to drive a Toyota. You learn to drive. So we're going to cover, in most cases, a heavy emphasis of the technology prior to going into the technology, so you'll be able to pick it out anywhere. For example, as a cloud architect or a solution architect or a cloud solution architect, if you know you need a virtual machine, it's not going to matter if you need an EC2 instance on AWS. 
something from Google Compute Engine or something called the Virtual Machine in Azure. It's the same service. So we'll always talk about the industry standard first, and then after the industry standard first, then we will go into the specific AWS components. So we'll do lectures, we'll do labs, and of course we'll do question and answer sessions. So happy to see all you folks here. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So let's begin. So when we're gonna begin and talk about the AWS cloud, I first wanna start out with the basics. How is the cloud organized? Now, when we do this, we're gonna get into a little bit of depth. There's certain things that are covered on the associate and certain things that you need to know that are beyond that. So wanna make sure you have beyond that, but I'll let you know what's gonna be on the exam versus those other things that you should know as well. Cause I want you to be a great solution architect, cloud solution architect or cloud architect. So let's get you guys cloud hired and let's get you guys AWS certified. Let's go right now. So welcome everyone. So let's begin with the layout of the cloud. So before we even begin, I want to just tell you what is a cloud? A cloud is nothing more than a data center and a network that's just been virtualized. Literally speaking, that's it. So when people hear what is cloud computing and they give you all these complicated answers, very simply, it's the same network and the same data center we always did. We just moved the data center from our own building to the AWS cloud. Same thing, doesn't matter. So almost everything is gonna be the same. So if you wanna be a great cloud architect or a solutions architect, learn the data center in the cloud. So we're gonna cover some data center and cloud technologies. But I want you to at least understand how the cloud is structured. So we're dealing with the cloud and I'll show you some visual um, frames of reference soon. But realistically speaking with a couple environments, we're dealing with a region and availability zone, a local zone and an edge location. Now for your exam, you're gonna need to do the reads and the availability zone and the edge locations, but if you're gonna do the certified solution architect professional, or actually wanna do some working as a cloud architect, you're probably gonna need to know the local zone. So first way I'd like you to think of it is, let's think of a region. Think of a huge area. Let's say a continent or half of a continent. That's what is considered a region to your cloud computing provider. So a region is this massive area a country or a continent. That's typically a region. Now inside of regions, there's data centers. Remember the cloud is just a virtual network and a data center. I'm meaning virtual, it's a physical data center and a physical network with some, soft, some software sitting on top of it called the, which is called the control plane that manages the cloud. So AWS is gonna have thousands of data centers all over the world. And a data center is called an availability zone. And I'm actually gonna walk you through each and every one of the things in much more depth, but I just wanna introduce the concept first. Now, when you're doing your work, computing work in your data center, it's close to you. I mean, maybe it's 50 feet, maybe it's 100 meters, maybe it's 500 meters, it's close to you. So when you're dealing with internet performance and network performance and computing performance, what are you really dealing with? Connectivity between you, the user, and the server. So the closer the server is going to be to you, the better your performance is going to get. So when you're dealing with cloud, the cloud may be a thousand miles away from you. And it may take you two milliseconds or three milliseconds to go from your business to the cloud. That might be too much for some applications. There are applications where a nanosecond is a competitive advantage and a millisecond, which is a thousand times that is huge. So for organizations that need better, lower latency performance, there's something called the local zone, and I'll show you the graphics for this. And that's basically a data center closer to you where you can access your systems. So maybe, for example, you put a local zone in Miami, and I, I store some of my servers there. Now, the last part that we're gonna talk about from a high level, and then I'll walk you through and show you more about them, is something called an edge location. So when we get to CloudFront and we talk about content delivery networks, we're gonna talk about edge locations very heavily. These are the ways that the AWS cloud is organized. So let's really try to uh, architecturally and visually, let's look at it. So going back to our traditional environment, here's what we've got for the cloud. Notice you've got this big giant area, which is in, in green. That is the AWS region. Now inside that region, we've got a lot of data centers. That's called an availability zone. So where is your data? Where is your information when you connect to AWS? It's stored in availability zones. It's stored in their data centers. That's it. So region, large geographic area, data center, availability zone. Now you've got a general idea of the basics of the way the cloud is organized. 
let's dive a little deeper. So now let's talk about the local zone because the local zone is really great and it's relatively new. So all of this, when we connect to the cloud, the cloud is far away from us. So because the cloud is far away, it takes time. The speed of light is 186,000 miles per second, but it still takes time. New York to London might be five milliseconds round trip time. That's a lot. Imagine a financial trading application that's processing 100,000 trades a minute. And if you can process a trade a millisecond faster than your competition, it could equate to a few hundred million dollars of revenue per year over a millisecond. Well, these organizations can either say no to cloud computing or they can place their, their, their stuff in an environment that's close to them. And that's really called a local zone. So local zone is edge computing. So let's do this one more time. Let's talk about a local zone and we'll go over all these and things and summarize before we close this session. A local zone is an extension of your region. Basically, it's a new data center that's closer to your users. So it enables you to put your servers, your storage, your access to your systems closer to the users. So it's like anything else. And if I have to go from Palm Beach to Philadelphia, even on an airplane, it takes me two hours, for example, two and a half hours. That's a long time. But if I could fly at 500 miles an hour or a thousand or, you know, 600 miles an hour or a thousand kilometers an hour, and I only had to go two, two miles away, it'd be super fast, sub minute. So that's what this local zone is that it enables you to run computing power close to the user. So this is where you'll see you'll create a local zone. You'll put a subnet in your in your local zone. We'll talk more about subnets and IP networking throughout the program. Kaylin Krishna, I'm so happy to have you here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put your computing in there, whether it be EC2 instances, load balancers, we'll put them all there. Now, some environments and some local zones are really, really, really um, capable. For example, in LA, the LA local zone, you can run file system for Windows. We'll talk about it. Elastic load balancers, we'll talk about it. Map reduction functions for big data environments, um, certain databases, and even some caching. So some of these local zones get very sophisticated. So let's talk about architecturally what they look like, and then we'll, we'll summarize all of these zones and environments and availability zones again. So now, let's look at it this way. This is what a local zone would be. You basically enable it, which basically takes your virtual private cloud, and we're going to talk a lot more about that. I mean, in real, real, real depth, and we're going to take it from there, and then you'll put your applications there. So you'll connect to your local zone, and it will be so close. So that's why we do what we do. So now let's architecturally look at the pieces again. So remember, I said a region is a very large geographic area. That's a region. An availability zone is the data center inside of that region. Now, the local zone is just creating another data center that's close to you. So you put one in, say, Miami. So that way, instead of me going to US East 1, which I believe is in Ohio, I can just go to the one in Miami. It's much faster to get to Miami when I live in Palm Beach than it is to get to Ohio. So that's what we're dealing with this low latency computing. So I hope that makes sense to you. So now you know region, large geographic area, availability zone, data center, local zone, small data center close to you. That's it. So now let's talk about edge locations. So we're going to talk a lot more about content delivery networks, but and I know this will be out of order. I want to cover a little bit about edge locations now. And the reason I want to do this for you is uh, I want, I, we're going to be discussing uh, content delivery networks, web scaling, and caching. So I figure now is a really good chance to just try and go over some of those introductory concepts real quickly. So when we're dealing with an edge location, an edge location is going to be where a user is going to access your web apps through the CloudFront Content Delivery Network. And I'll describe to you what they are. Edge locations are used to provide local access to web things in major cities. Edge locations and CloudFront Content Delivery Networks are designed to increase performance, reduce latency, and help your organization scale. And we'll show you why. So realistically speaking, let's show you architecturally what's going on in the cloud so you guys kind of get it. So going back to the same thing, huge, large geographic region called a region. 
in between each region, you've got data centers called availability zones. Now we've got this, you know, cloud front, edge location kind of thing going on. So what's really happening? What is a content delivery network? So let's say I'm here. I live around Palm Beach, Florida. Let's say I want to go to www.gocloudcareers.com, our website. Let's say my website or our website is hosted in California. So I'm in Florida. So what I do is I go to my browser. I type www.gocloudcareers.com. Instantly DNS resolves or DNS, which provides name to name to IP address services. We'll talk about it a lot more. Basically says, okay, Mike, here's the fastest hop onto the network. Jump onto the network in Miami at this edge location. So I go to Miami and I hit that Miami edge location. Now that is basically 60 miles from my home. So how long do you think it takes at 186,000 miles a second to go 60 miles? Not long. So I hit this place in Miami with my web request. I go www.gocloudcareers.com. I stop at this edge location. If the edge location has it, because someone earlier that day went to go request this information, it's sent to me directly from Miami. My web servers never see it. So I get lots of scalability because my web servers aren't being bothered for frequently accessed information. Now, what also happens is if that's not the case, I jumped onto this network in Miami. Now I'm actually on the content delivery networks network and we'll talk about why later that is so much important as opposed to being on the public internet. I hit the edge, the cloud front edge location. It's not there. I immediately grow across the high performance AWS backbone instead of the internet backbone. I hit my availability zone. The availability zones where the web server it is, it sends it to the regional cloud front, um, uh, what do you call it, cache. It'll then send it to the edge location and now I will be served the information. Now my wife, who, Who's a who decides to go to gocloudcareers.com, also from Palm Beach? She hits that edge location and the data is already sent to her because it's cached. Now, my brother comes to Florida and he wants to go to gocloudcareers.com and again, it's cached at the edge location. So it never sees the web servers and it reduces latency. So, large geographic area, region, data center purge, large geographic area, availability zone, edge location where you access the content. Delivery network called CloudFront, the AWS branded one. Show you one more visual picture of this, and we're going to get to this a lot more later. So let's say you've got a traditional website. You've got some static assets, say some video files, and some dynamic access. Let's say you've got user subscriptions. Awesome. Here's the way it works. The user, you can pick any of these users that you desire, will go request a web page from the edge location. If the edge location has it, it will send it. If not, the user hits the edge location, the edge location goes to the, uh, basically your systems and it will pull the video, for example, out of S3. It will then be sent to the S edge location. It will be sent to you. All subsequent requests until the cache times out are going to go to this edge location. So we're going to deal with the virtual private cloud in about two minutes. But before we do this, does anybody have any quick questions on what is an availability zone? What is a, what is a, a region, what is an edge location, and what is a content delivery network? If so, ask your questions now. Otherwise, we're going to have fun and we're going to go straight to what is the AWS virtual private cloud. We'll cover it at a high level now and then we'll get real, real, real deep later. Any, uh, okay, so Chris from the team is bringing up. Sir, cached at the edge location means that the Go Cloud was already stored there the first time. Okay, what really happens is the first time what actually happens with the content delivery network is I make a request. If it is there, it sends it to me. And the only way it will be there is if someone else requested the content previously to me. If no one else requested the content, I will go to the content delivery network and the request will go back to the to my original servers, the servers will send it back to the content delivery network, and then it will be sent back to me. So let's walk through this one more time. People have actually asked the questions that I do this, so let's do it. Let's go through this one more time. I am a user. I would like to request a web page. I want to go to www.aws.com. So I'm the user. I type www.aws.com. 
I get return and the IP address for the CloudFront distribution of the content delivery network, because that's what DNS tells me with the domain name services. I then make a request for the web page going through that CloudFront edge location. So if it's stored on there, great. If it's not stored on there, me, the user, goes directly to the edge location that's not here. My request gets sent straight to the web servers. The web servers send it back to the regional cache, which sends it back to the edge location, which is now distributed to me. So now if another user hits the same edge location, they will be there. This edge location is, say, Palm Beach or Miami. Now, this edge location might be London. For example, let's say someone here is in London. They decide to go to the edge location. And it's there. They get it immediately. The next person goes there. It's immediately. Why would it be there immediately? Because um, somebody else previously requested it. Now, let's say we've got someone in Lagos and they've never requested the page. So they go to, let's say, in Nigeria, somewhere in Lagos or someplace else. There is a content delivery edge location. So the user in Lagos goes to the edge location in Nigeria. The edge location in Nigeria says, I don't have it. So it routes it across the AWS network back to your environment. It, you, you respond, you send it to the edge location, and the edge location sends it back to the user. So what's going on is in a seamless environment, your customers, your users have no idea you're using a content delivery network. All they know is their web page is really fast. So think about this. Let's say you've got static content such as video, like Netflix. You put your stuff in an environment and then you push it out through your content delivery network. Now, imagine, let's say there's a movie that everybody watches on Netflix. Let's say it gets watched 100,000 times a day by people in Miami, because it probably is. So they only have to go to the edge location once. It gets requested that content is stored on that edge location. And then it's the edge location that's constantly sending the data, the videos to the people in their house to watch the TV shows. So now you kind of understand how this kind of works. Edge locations are where the servers are, where the caching environment is as part of the content delivery network. We will cover content delivery network in a lot more depth and how they work and why they use them. But I just wanted to introduce the content very, very, very briefly. So some people have asked, we're going to keep this video on YouTube and we're going to keep it on YouTube so you can watch it again and again because we understand it may take a few times to actually go through the material and truly master it. So you can go back anytime you want. So the question was asked, if the cache data is on one edge, it does not propagate it to the other edge locations. It only happens as soon as a user actually requests it. So um, what is the relationship, by the way, between a local zone and an edge location? Absolutely nothing. An edge location is related to the content delivery network, specifically for web app. So it's related to get to a web page faster. Now, when we're actually dealing with, uh, Chris, the question came down from the screen. Now, when we're actually dealing with a local zone, what we're dealing with is the users that want to run servers locally, and they don't have to be web servers. They can be application servers. They can be database servers. They could be any kind of server, algorithmic servers that are running things, literally anything. So go through it again. Large geographic area region data center in a region is called an availability zone you want to put your servers at the edge of the network that's called a local zone and if you want to have a content delivery network to improve the speed and performance of your web apps you will be using cloudfront edge locations on the aws cloud there are lots and lots and lots of wonderful content delivery networks but since it's an aws certified solution architect associate course we're going to mention the aws one but Cloudflare has a great content delivery network. Akamai has a great content delivery network. So lots of content delivery networks out there, but we're specifically talking about the AWS services. So this is Cloudfront. So now, let, now that we've talked about you know, the Cloudfront, the edge locations, the local zones, the availability zones and regions, let's address the virtual private cloud a little bit. So. And a cloud computing environment is really a network and a data center that's got a little bit of software on it to virtualize it all for you. So that's what the VPC is. So that's the cloud. Now, inside of the cloud provider's data center, you need your own virtual private environment. Because otherwise, 
you'd have your data mixed with everybody else's data on the same system. Guess what? You are on the same systems as everybody else, but you're logically separated. You're logically separated by something called a virtual private cloud. So a virtual private cloud is basically your network. Now I've heard people call the virtual private cloud a virtual private network. I kind of hate that because to me as a network architect, a virtual private network is basically when you create private network connectivity in a public network. Now in this particular case, it's something that's a little bit different. We're creating an environment that they call a VPC or virtual private cloud that really lets you put your servers, your storage, all of it. So it's basically like your own virtual private data center. That's the way I like to view the virtual private cloud, the virtual private data center. So architecturally, let's look at what this actually looks like. So for example, here's your virtual cl private cloud environment. Nope, you've got the AWS cloud. Big cloud, big cloud provider. And inside of that, you carve out or you, the cloud provider creates for you your own isolated environment inside of this big environment. That's called a virtual private cloud or VPC. So as you can see in this example, and apologies, I didn't realize that I have my, my uh, microphone not on me. We should hopefully give you some better sound here. Hopefully that's a lot better. Um, inside of the virtual private cloud, we can see the blue customer, the green customer, the red customer, the yellow customer. This is really what we're talking about all logically separated inside of the same cloud. Can you guys hear me better now? Were you guys able to hear me before? Because nobody said anything. If you can let me know if you could have always hear me, like just let me know by typing cloud architect that you could hear me. But now hopefully you should be able to hear you. Hopefully you, you guys can all hear. So wonderful. So now let's, let's talk a little bit more. Okay, so did this make it lower when I moved my microphone here? Okay, so this is not normal. Okay, so let's try and play with this. How about now? Mike, it sounded better the second time you moved it. How about now? Yes, there you go. Okay, excellent. So apologies, everyone, for that. So let's go back to our virtual private cloud. Inside of our cloud provider, we've got logically isolated separate cloud computing environments. So that's called the virtual private cloud. So let's walk through this a little more and have a little fun with this VPC kind of concept. So when we're dealing with a cloud, basically it's a hosted network in a data center. So let's talk about the kind of cloud environments we're gonna be dealing with. Most cases, we're gonna be dealing with something called a hybrid cloud or a multi-cloud. And we'll tell you why these things are going on so you guys can be pre prepared to get Cloud Architect hired. So they're gonna have basically, we'll talk about some architectures and what they would be. For example, let's start with the hybrid cloud. This is the most common environment you're gonna see as a cloud architect or as a solutions architect or as a cloud solutions architect. And what this is, is you're gonna have a company that's gonna have their own data center because guess what? Companies that have been in existence have their own data centers. So they're gonna have their own data center. Now let's say you've got an organization and let's say this great organization has invested, let's say for example, 50 or a hundred million dollars on servers, networking switches, firewalls. If somebody spent a hundred million dollars on their architecture and their infrastructure and it's working, just because the cloud can offer some new and better services, does it mean we should give up on that hundred million dollar investment? For most organizations, the answer is no. So what most organizations are doing is they're running their data centers and they're either offloading their data centers to the cloud or they're running some specialty services in the cloud that the cloud can do better than the data center and they're running their big compute in their data center. Because let's be fair, the data center offers better performance than the cloud, but the cloud is more agile and the cloud is generally cheaper. So it's about choosing the best thing that you've got. But if you've got an organization that's got a massive data center and 50,000 servers, use them. Build them a hybrid cloud, connect their data center to the cloud, install an OpenStack Ansible or Nutanix software on the organization's data center and build them a cloud. That way they can have all the auto scaling and all the great stuff that makes people love the cloud and still dynamically connect to GCP, 
Azure, AWS, all at the same time, and they can even configure their own things and it'll deploy them on every cloud provider. So what you're gonna see is a lot of what we do is hybrid cloud. Hybrid cloud is the traditional network in the data center blended with the cloud. Excellent, excellent, excellent. If an organization's got a lot of tech, this may be the optimal solution. If an organization wants to go completely to the cloud and they wanna try it halfway, they can keep their data center, move some things to a cloud and they get a good experience. Hybrid cloud, your own data center and a cloud. So this is what we're talking about. This is real architecture. This is realistically what exists. Now, after this, let's talk about a pure cloud. Now, this is not common, a pure cloud environment. A pure cloud environment is where basically you take a brand new business and they say, everyone that I want to do, we're going to go to the cloud. Awesome. So what you do in a pure cloud is nothing's been there. You just figure out how to design your systems to run best on the cloud. What do your servers look like? What do your containers look like? Your firewalls, literally all of that, your internet connection strategies, your networking strategies, identical things in every way to the data center, but now on an outsourced managed data center. That's it. The cloud is just an outsourced managed virtualized data center. That is it. Take all the mysticism out of it. I've been working on cloud since 1998. It's no big deal. It's not new technology. It's just a hosted network and data center. So realistically speaking, predominantly hybrid clouds, but a pure cloud is when you put everything on the cloud. Now let's think of the pure cloud and the risks of it. If you put all your eggs in AWS and AWS goes down, you're down. If you put all your eggs in the Azure basket and it's down, you're down. So practicality, I want you to think of the pure cloud is not optimal for 90% of the organizations, but there are alternatives that are better. So a single pure cloud, very risky. It's like the cable company. Could you imagine putting all your investments and all your assets in the cable company? And then six months later, the cable company raises your rates. You are in trouble. So that's why organizations do that often don't do a single pure cloud. But a pure cloud is great because it's good for a startup. You don't have anything to buy, nothing to buy, just pay for what you use. It's incredibly scalable. The speed and the agility of deployments in these pure cloud environments is second to none. And uh, realistically speaking, it's very simple because all the work we do in the data center, the racking, the stacking, the patching, all of it is all gone. Well, the racking, the stacking, installing the operating systems, you know, hypervisor, all that stuff is done for you from the cloud provider. So hybrid, data center plus cloud, pure cloud, all in a single cloud. So here's what a single cloud looks like. Single pure cloud environment. Let me show you what it looks like. You basically have your organization, connections to the cloud, and it's it. Everything is in the cloud. And this is what they typically talk about in certification courses. Everything's on the cloud. But look at Facebook yesterday. They had an outage. They have some of the best network architects in the world and network engineers. And they still made a BGP misconfiguration issue. It happens. So if a pure cloud is when an organization connects to the cloud and it's all hosted in one cloud provider, that's a little risky. So when it comes to networking, you know, let's say we wanted to connect to two environments, two data centers. In the US, I might use AT&T as a one, so one service provider, and I might also use Verizon. I could use Vodafone or Orange. I could use NTT Data and CenturyLink. It doesn't matter, but I never, 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 ever buy my connections across the same service provider between two facilities. Why? If I buy all my connections through, a, through Verizon and Verizon's down, I have no network. So organizations always use two providers, three providers, AT&T and Verizon for the networking connections. Guess what? You know what the new cloud is? Multi-cloud. Connect to Azure, connect to AWS, connect to GCP. This is the way we cloud architecture designing systems. You can't put all your eggs in one basket. You can't have single points of failure. Anyone that thinks they're going to work on just AWS as a cloud architect is mistaken. It is always hybrid cloud and multi-cloud. So we'll talk about that. So when now what you're going to see, you're either going to see hybrid clouds like Nutanix has a great cloud software that can be placed in the organization's data center connected to a single cloud or multi-cloud. Red Hat, IBM, OpenStack, Ansible, Ubuntu has a version of this. It is brilliant. You can build your own cloud. And this is what many organizations do. 
I have coached so many organizations to build their own clouds and connect it to multiple cloud providers. That is the world. Multi-cloud hybrid cloud. Look at it this way. Look at Google right now. Look at the environment they have. Best, biggest search engine in the world, Google. Second biggest search engine in the world, YouTube, where we're all having fun right now. And by the way, since we're talking about YouTube, if you're enjoying the content, please leave a like or a comment or type, call it hard. But that's neither here nor there. So these they, the algorithms that are done by Google, which are so good, realistically speaking, they've got a great machine learning environment. They've got libraries for everything. Two biggest search engines in the world. So let's think about it. Connect to Google for AI machine learning. They connect to AWS because their infrastructure is so good. Connect to Azure as a backup. Seriously, think about this. You're giving your customers the best environment and the ultimate redundancy. So this is why we talk about it. Hybrid cloud, great data center to the con to the to the cloud. Um, PR cloud connections to just the hosted data center. Multi cloud today's environment. Cloud the cloud the cloud the cloud the cloud. This is what we do as cloud architects. We design whatever is in the best interest of our customers. Whatever solves the customer's problem, gives them new routes to revenue, increases their ability to offer services. This is what architects do. We solve business problems. So we are very different doing this, the way we solve business problems. That So this is a business role. So please understand that. Now, if you're going to put all your tech on the cloud, you got to be able to reach it. So there's two kinds of tech that an organization will have. There's the external facing stuff. The website, www.gocloudcareers.com. External facing website, www.gocloudcareers.com. So, you know, that's how that, that is a website that can be accessed over the internet. But what about my private servers? What about all the video content we're doing, our digital marketing strategies, all of the things? I don't want people seeing that. That's internal stuff. And normally we store that on internal servers. But if we're using the cloud as our data center, guess what? The cloud becomes our internal servers. So the cloud's now our servers. So we're going to need a private secure connectivity to connect to the cloud. And realistically speaking, there's two ways we can do this. We can either buy a wire or a pseudo wire or the equivalent of a wire between an organization's data center and a cloud, or we can create a tunnel through the internet and both have their strengths and both have their weaknesses. So we're gonna begin by talking about how do we connect to the cloud? Because this is really important, this is networking. So let's talk about it. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, so let's first talk about virtual private networks. What is a virtual private network? We will ask to answer these architectural questions that are coming in shortly. Um, actually, you know what, let's go answer some questions before we go to the virtual private networks. I see a few questions came in. So let's do the following. Um, going back, I think what's going on, Stephanie here is if you, uh, uh let's, uh, so how does a local zone work with a cl hybrid cloud or then your precedence rules? That's based on Stephanie upon the way you're going to set the routing and you're going to set the policy. So it's up to you as the architect to design the flow and to design the routing. Chris, you want to bring up the next one? Isn't it expensive connecting to all three clouds in a multi-cloud environment? Well, yes, but not necessarily. But the cost of doing otherwise is not there. Yesterday's Facebook outage cost them $7 billion. How much do you think it would have cost them to have uh, a disaster recovery in an environment in another cloud provider? where they ran small instances of everything they needed and they needed auto scaling. A couple million bucks a year to save $7 billion, it's more expensive. When you're dealing with people that are paying for cloud architects, I mean really a cloud architect, you're dealing with people that are willing to pay a $300,000 salary to a cloud architect. Because we cloud architects in the big environment, you know, these are expensive careers. It's only the junior salaries that are in that $150,000 range. A good cloud architect can earn double that or triple that based upon their business acumen, emotional intelligence, um, executive presence, communication skills. That's realistically speaking what determines you know, what these architects get paid. And if an organization is willing to pay an architect, a real architect, 
The reason they're doing this is as follows. The cost of downtime is so high to them that literally speaking, you can lose a million dollars in some of these businesses within 60 seconds of downtime. So you can lose $10 million inside of 60 seconds of downtime with some of these organizations. I work with healthcare organizations where if the systems go down, someone will die. I work with banking organizations where a minute of downtime is $10 million. I work with organizations like this. They can't afford not to use multi-cloud. They just can't. So in military, they say one is none, two is one, and three is better than two. It is the same thing. An organization cannot exist without insurance. Now, we'll probably talk about disaster recovery strategies, and there's ways to do disaster recovery that are super cheap, and there's ways to do disaster recovery that, for that is extremely expensive, and it's going to be based upon what the customer's needs are. But in most cases, a customer cannot afford to do this. But also, we'll talk more about building high availability systems, give you a little bit of a leak of some information we're going to talk about later. So let's say you needed to achieve 99.999% availability. All kinds of customers need this. That means less than five minutes of downtime per year. With AWS, you have to do two availability zones in two separate regions. So four availability zones just to get to five nines. You could do two availability zones in Azure and two availability zones in AWS. It's pay the same price. And guess what? Now you're fully redundant. So it's not whether someone can afford to do it, it's whether they can afford not to do multi-cloud or hybrid clouds or more secure, reliable environments. Most organizations can't tolerate that cost of downtime. Sure, if my website's down for a couple hours, who cares? But if Netflix is down for a few hours, there's, there's a lot of problems going down, so. And if it's a business, so now you know. So now we're gonna start talking about connecting to the cloud B3 collector. And here's where we're going to talk about VPNs and direct connections. So you beat me to it. To let you guys know, we will have labs throughout the program. Today, in the beginning, we're sending the fundamentals, making sure that you guys know exactly where you need to be. So this is great. So before we touch direct connections, if you're having fun, could you type cloud architect in the chat box? Then I know you're having a good time. And then after this, we are going to go back. We're going to start talking about direct connections and VPN and then connections. So let me go back to talking about these connections. But please type Cloud Hired if you're having fun. Leave a like. Leave a comment. Share it with a friend. We want to provide as much free training to the community as we can. So let's talk about connecting to the cloud. When we're connecting to the cloud, we have two options. We can buy a wire to the cloud. We can basically connect to the cloud, cloud through a technology called a virtual private network. And I want you guys to understand this. We, we have these two options. We can buy a wire to the cloud, or we can tunnel to the cloud through the internet. And I want you to think about it logically. We're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages, and we're probably going to start with VPNs because they're much cheaper. Here's what a VPN is. I connect to the internet and I tunnel my traffic through the internet. So if we're gonna transmit our data through the internet, does anybody see any problems? I mean, does anybody see any problems when your data goes through the internet? Well, the internet is not secure. So let's talk about the type of VPNs that we're typically using when we connect to the cloud provider over a VPN. So if we were to just connect to the internet, just over the internet, um, you know, we'd be connecting over the internet, which means that everybody could see our data. The internet is not secure. So yes, you guys, perfect. You've got a security hole. Thanks for putting it in the chat window. So we need a lot of security. So internet is insecure. Now let's talk about routing information. When we're on the internet, we can't use private IP addresses which means we can't have something in the RFC 1918 private address space. You guys know that private address space that organizations use internally, the 10.0.0 slash eight address space, the 172.16 slash 12 address space, the 192.168.0.0 slash 16. And if you guys don't know, we'll cover it because that kind of networking knowledge or basic essentials of networking is just so critical. So we can't go to the internet because it's not secure. So we have to encrypt our traffic across the internet. We can't use private IP addresses across the internet 
because we need a public address. So we have to tunnel those IP addresses. Now, because we need to pass routing information and because we need to pass private IP address, we have to tunnel it through the internet. So what are we going to do? We're going to create a VPN and it's going to look like this to you, the user. It's going to be seamless. We're basically going to have a data center on one side. We're going to have our VPC on the other side. We are going to connect to the internet on both sides. And because we connect to the internet on both sides, it's now reachable. We are going to create a tunnel in between the two environments over the internet. And we are going to encrypt that tunnel with something called IPsec or IP security. Now, IPsec or IP security is an incredible suite of protocols. It's going to do the following. It's going to make sure that the sender knows who the receiver is. So we've got two cloud architects on this call that are teaching the course and 324 of you right now, 2,000 people have almost attended so far. So this is a fun morning or fun afternoon. So here, let's say I want to speak to my cloud architect, Buddy Alonzo. Alonzo's in his data center. I'm on the cloud. I want to send data to Alonzo. I don't want to send data to somebody else pretending to be Alonzo. I want to send data to Alonzo. So IPsec does the following. IPsec will determine who is the user and who is the recipient. So what will happen is this. I will establish a connection with Alonzo. The first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to verify that Alonzo is, in fact, Alonzo. We do this with the key association and the key exchange that occurs when we set up a VPN. So first thing I'm going to use IPsec for is to verify that Alonzo is Alonzo. Because if Alonzo is not Alonzo and I give Alonzo information, I could be dealing with a spy, which could hurt me. So IPsec does endpoint verification. So endpoint verification verifies the authenticity of the user. So first thing we achieve via IPsec is that I can connect to Alonzo. Alonzo is connected to me. And Alonzo is really Alonzo. So that's the basis of a good conversation. I know that Alonzo is Alonzo. Now, the next thing that IPsec is going to do, it's going to use what's called the hashing algorithm. Here's what a hash is. You take a piece of data, you take that data, you run a mathematical calculation on it, and you get some kind of a number. That number is always going to be the same. If you hash the letter A, you're always going to get the same hash. If you hash the letter B, you will always get the same hash. But you can't go from B, um, the, the hash back to B or the hash back to A. So it's kind of cool that way. So I saw some message from people join. Don't worry. We're happy to have you here. Just thrilled to have you here. It doesn't matter when you get here. You can always watch some of the replay tonight. So just good that you're here. So realistically speaking, so what have we done? I verified that Alonzo is Alonzo. And I verified that the message hasn't been changed. Now think about this. If I wanted to send Alonzo $1,000 and some attacker on the internet added six zeros, that could be financially problematic for me. I want to send a thousand and it gets turned into a million or a billion. So not good. So IPsec enables you to verify the endpoints, but it also enables you to make sure your messages hasn't been changed. Now IPsec does one more thing. It's called non-repudiation. So if I send Alonzo a message and then afterwards I realize this message is not too professional, I can't say that I didn't send it to Alonzo because IPsec provides this. So why are we using IPsec? What is a VPN? A VPN is basically we connect to the internet on both sides. We create a tunnel. And inside of the tunnel, we send our data. We use private IP addresses. We use an encryption algorithm so nobody can view the data. We use a hacking algorithm to make sure it can't be changed. And we make sure because we keep sequence numbers that messages were sent and received. Hope everybody understands that's what an IPsec VPN is. We're creating IPsec VPNs. So why would an organization choose to use a VPN to connect to the cloud? Well, internet access is, the, uh, is pretty abundant and it's cheap. So what do I need to do with, to set up a VPN? I connect to the internet on both sides. All I need to do is create an IPsec tunnel, push my routing information, and it's done and it works perfectly. So simple. So that's why we like it. Guess what? I can do this in minutes. So much in minutes, literally that fast, that easy. So what else can I do with the VPN? I can create a connection to the internet and I can create multiple connections to multiple places. Say I'm in New York. 
I want to connect to Lagos, Johannesburg, Delhi, Bangalore, London, Miami, San Jose. I can do this completely simply by just creating a new VPN over my same internet connections. So this is really what I'm trying to convey to you is that uh, that's why organizations use VPNs. Now, that's great, right? It's cheap, already have the internet connections. It's fast, you can do it in seconds. You wanna get a private line or a link between two organizations, that could take you four to six weeks. I can set up a VPN in 10 seconds. Pretty awesome. Now, can anybody think of problems with the VPNs? Because there's a lot of them. Well, it is not exactly what you'd consider the most reliable. When we buy a private line, and we're going to talk about it, if you buy a 100 gig link, it's always a 100 gig link. If the link to New York and London is two milliseconds today, it's going to be two milliseconds tomorrow, two milliseconds next week, two milliseconds next year. I can plan and guarantee it. On the internet, guess what? There are no guarantees. The internet's what's called best effort, meaning I get my traffic to the internet and hopefully it gets to my destination. So do you guys think critical information should be sent on a network which we hope it gets there? Seriously, think about this. You're gonna have a video call with your doctor. You're gonna be doing eye surgery with a robotic arm. Can you afford to have your data lost along the way and cut out the wrong eye? No, or cut off the wrong lump? No. So with the internet, you get best effort delivery, which means you, you could have 100 gig connection. You might get one meg, you may get nothing, or 100, all 100 gigs. The latency can be one millisecond or 100 milliseconds, or not get there at all. So the internet is best effort. So if you ever do a trace route on your computer or a trace RT on a Windows system from the command prompt, and you type trace, www.cisco.com, you'll get to see the number of internet service providers you go with. So now you kind of get that. That's why the, that's the downside of VPNs. Good, fast, good, cheap, good, fast. You can do it in minutes, create multi-sites real easy, but the downside is as follows. The downside is no guarantees that your data gets anywhere, no guarantees of performance, no guarantees of anything. So with the benefits, there's a whole lot of detractors. So let's talk a little bit about VPNs on AWS. Um, and then we'll get into the direct connection and really what you guys are going to be doing as architects a lot more of the time. Um, so when you connect to just one site, it's going to be called a site to site VPN. The site to site VPN is me setting up a tunnel to my good friend and great cloud architect, Alonzo Coleman. That's a site to site VPN. What is a multi site VPN on this call? There is uh, Christopher Johnson, my chief operating officer, who's an amazing, amazing, amazing operations. Ex excellent, excellent. Keep me in line every single day. I can create a link to uh, Chris Johnson is on this call. I can create a link to Alonzo Coleman all through my same internet connection. That's a multi-site VPN. So realistically speaking, when you connect AWS, you're gonna be using their virtual router. You're gonna be using your own router. And when you're dealing with these kind of things, Basically, you're going to have your packet. It's going to be encapsulated into another packet, which is basically the IPSec tunnel, and it's going to be sent across the internet. So now you kind of know what that works. So you'll set up the tunnel. It'll do its internet key exchange and association, which will determine the internet, the encryption type, the algorithm. And of course, you can run static routes by manually configuring every route on your system. And then where you can use dynamic routing like BGP. And this way, when you get cable cuts, your environment can be self-healing. So of course, you're going to use BGP. And of course, on our channel, there are lots of videos on introductions to BGP. Chris and my team can do some. If you're a cloud architect or a solutions architect, you must know BGP. Lots and lots of BGP information on my channel. Chris from my team will pop some BGP things in there. But tonight, remember, because of what happened with Facebook, we're going to do a live BGP session. So please join us. And we'll keep that session in case you guys are somewhere in Asia or it's too late for you guys. You can watch the replay in the morning. So we'll be talking about what is BGP, the routing protocol tonight. Anybody that desires a career in the cloud should learn this. I've been teaching BGP for almost two and a half decades, so please attend. So when you're dealing with an AWS VPN, they want to call it highly available. And I have some mixed feelings about this strategy. So let's talk about where it works and where it does not work. 
So when you connect to AWS and you create a tunnel to them, one good thing that AWS does is they actually create multiple tunnels for you to multiple availability zones. So if I connect to US East 1, it'll connect me to US East West 2. And that way, by default, I've got some redundancy, which I love. And when you set up your VPNs, you can do them in, a, in two ways. You can have VPNs that are, say, active to, to US East West, US East, and US West. You can do that. Or you can have an active and a backup, and realistically speaking, now, for most users, most users, active and backup is probably going to be good. But if you know something about networking and you're capable in networking, organizations are not going to want to have an active and backup. They're going to use all their connections. So let's look, realistically speaking, at why AWS calls this a high availability environment and why those of us that are experts in high availability networking would say this is not. Here's the good news. So typically speaking in AWS, which is really great, this is your customer router in your data center, and you typically set up a VPN, and one of the endpoints it goes to is in, say, one availability zone, and the next, uh, what do you call it, um, tunnel is created to another availability zone. Now, this is great. AWS automatically gives you two virtual routers in two different availability zones. So on the AWS side, it's high availability. But now, is this really okay? No. Here's why it's not okay. What happens if this router fails in the organization's data center? All the connections are down. So just because AWS is redundant doesn't mean this is an acceptable environment for high availability computing. This is the AWS recommendation. If you see this on an exam, this is a high availability connection. Why? Because it's a logical router on the AWS side. And you know what? They've done the redundancy on them for you. But if you're serious, you need a minimum of two routers on the customer side. And you need a minimum of two different internet connections across separate internet service providers. Because if all your links are in Verizon, if Verizon goes down, you've got no connections. So you need redundant routers on your end and you need redundant connections. So this environment that AWS would demonstrate just like this isn't really high availability. I mean, it's better than nothing, but you really need two routers on your environment across two internet service providers and two VPN connections. So this is a good start, but not good enough. So that's what you would do if you really wanted to do this. If you really, really wanted to build a good high availability environment, you're gonna have two routers on your end two connections, and you're going to connect them to two different AWS environments. So military world, one is none, two is one, and three is better than two. So what I mean by that is never have one, always have two, three is better. So hope that makes sense to you. Now, how would you set up a VPN in the cloud? And this would be something we would do with you, but realistically speaking, we would need a public IP address and some other things that make it infeasible to kind of demonstrate it for this class. So what we do is fairly simple process. The first thing we do is, you know, as a, as a customer, we determine which virtual gateway we're going to connect to on the AWS side. That's it. And then we pick, you know, do we set up a static route, redistribute it in, or do we set up a dynamic route? Easy, easy peasy, no big deal. After that, we just configure our tunnels. So who, where are you going to connect? Static or dynamic routing. And here you go. We configure the tunnels. Now, there's two ways to do it. If you're me and you're a Cisco certified internet expert and network architect with 25 years experience, you're going to create your own IPsec configs and you're going to do your own traffic engineering. This is what you should do. Now, if you are not a network architect, and you're not really, really experienced on this, find a network architect. But if you don't have that option, here's what you want to do. The AWS will automatically give you a configuration that you can cut and paste into your router. And that's going to be for generic use cases and generic people. It'll be highly useful and highly helpful for you. So you can either create your own config to give you lots of control, or you can let the AWS wizard or however that works where they spit out a config for you give you something that will work. It will work. There's nothing wrong with it. So very simple. You basically set, determine your endpoint. 
You choose your mounting method and then you just set up your configuration and that is it and it's up and it's running. So now, if that is how you would set up a VPN, let's talk about when you actually need good performance. So VPN, simple, fast, cheap. Simple, fast, cheap, remember that. Easy, minutes, multiple connections, minutes, cheap. You already have the internet. So now you know. Now let's look at a better environment for organizations that have a little more money. It's much, much, much cheaper um, to use a VPN under most circumstances, but it's much, much, much higher performance under normal circumstances to buy a wire between point A and point B. A wire between New York and London always takes the same amount of time. A wire between Palm Beach and San Jose always takes the same amount of time. A wire between uh, Cameroon and Belgium is always going to take the same amount of time. See, that's the thing that we're really talking about. It's time and bandwidth. So if we need something good, we're going to buy a wire to the cloud or a private line to the cloud. Now, when we're dealing with AWS, of course, their marketing geniuses came up with a term and they call it a direct connection. And the reality is, that's a really good name for it because it's directly connected. Now, with Azure, they call it something silly like Express Route. To me and every networking person in the world, this is a private line, and that's it. Buy a wire to the point locations. Cameroon by birthplace, fantastic. We actually have a lot of wonderful Cameroonian students. That's why I always think of the Cameroon. We've got students on the east side, on the English side, and the French side, um, which is pretty cool. So. If we're going to buy a wire or a pseudo wire, that's called a direct connection. So with this direct connection, we're going to get guaranteed bandwidth. We're going to get consistent latency, and we're going to get the most reliability. In the internet, your data could traverse a whole lot of routers, but not here. It's a wire. And when we deal with direct connections, we can do some really cool things. We can buy them in 1 gig, 10 gig, and now 100 gig. There used to be something called Ether Channel that for those people in the networking world where you could bundle a bunch of links together. And guess what? You can do it on the cloud. You can take four links and bundle them together as a single link. So four wires from AT&T all bundled together. Four 10 gig links bundled together looks like one 40 gig logical link. And it is really, really, really cool. So now you kind of know why we're dealing with something like this because we're getting guaranteed bound with consistent latency and reliability. And now you know what it could work. So think of this direct connection as a wire in your organization cloud. Well, it's not. It's going to be a single mode fiber optic connection between you and the direct connection location. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then basically it's going to be back hold. There's several stops. But logically, 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 for you to look at it and think about it, you're seeing this. You're seeing your data center who gets a direct connect to you directly all over a wire. Now, that's not what happens, but that's what it looks like logically. And I'll, I'll give you the real depth. I'll give you that certified solution architect professional level depth on this because you need it. You need to know it. So we'll get deeper, deeper, deeper than they even do on the solutions architect professional for this direct connection piece because it's critical to being a successful cloud architect. So... You want to be a cloud architect, solution architect, I want you guys to understand this wide area networking connectivity. So now let's talk about what's really going on. When you're getting a wire or your fiber optic connection, you're going to be using long distance fiber. So long distance fiber is something called single mode fiber. So when you're going to get a, a connection to the cloud, remember this could be a test question. The fiber optic connection is going to be a single mode fiber, 1000 base LX for gigabit ethernet, or 10G base dash LR, that's gonna be used for 10 gig ethernet. Now, if any of you guys have worked with long distance fiber optic connections, you're gonna know that there's a send link and there's a receive link. You send on one link, you receive on one link, you send on this link, receive on another. Now, it is completely possible for one of these links to go down and the other to be up and the routers and systems won't sense them. So, if you've got redundant links, and one of them goes down, but you don't know that it's down, you won't take up the backup link. So the good news is, is many years ago, about 18, 20 years ago, we came up with something called bi-directional forwarding detection. And what would happen is if you've got uh, your lasers are up and you've got a send link and a receive link, if this link goes away, for example, 
this link knows to go down and therefore you can take a backup path. So this is really kind of great. So let's realistically speak and walk through this really cool direct connection environment. This is what it's going to look like. You're going to take your on-premises environment and you're going to buy a WAN connection to something called the uh, direct connection location. And we're going to use two because we're going to have a primary and a backup pair. So we've got our router. We hit the direct connection location. We buy a wire from our service provider to this direct connection location. Now, that's to get to it. After we get to this, that only gets us to our router in the direct connection location. Now, we've got to connect to the AWS router or switch. So what happens is we do the following. We buy a connection to our device in the direct connection locator. Here is the AWS hardware. Here is our hardware. So we have to get a wire run from our router to their wire. This wire here, or fiber optic connection, whichever we're going to use, is called a cross connect because it connects this switch to this switch. So we get a router, we buy a wire, we hit our routers, that goes to the AWS environment. I mean, this is typically speaking something called backhold. Basically rides the AWS network back to your account. So you buy a WAN link to the con direct connection location. You have to connect to the direct connect to the AWS device. The AWS device is theirs and you need a cross connect and then it's backhauled. So how does this cross connect work? You need to be allowed to plug your device into the direct connect router. Otherwise you just can't plug into it. These are secure environments. So what you actually have to do to get that cross connect is you actually need to get authorization from AWS. So in order to create a direct connection, here's what you're gonna do. The first thing you need to do is you actually have to get a letter of authorization from AWS. And the letter from authorization, you can request it via the CLI, the API, or the management console. And what happens is you fill out an application and the application will configure the switch ports on your devices and their devices. And what will happen is they'll configure the switch port with their policy and they'll send you a, a letter of authorization that says request to connect to AWS is approved. And then they will run this wire between your systems and their systems. And there you go. You will be on the cloud. So that's it. That's how you directly connect to the cloud. It is a fantastic environment. So we'll cover a few more things on connections. I realize we've gotten way too heavy in networking. Why did I go a little extra above and beyond on networking? The cloud is a virtual network and a data center. When the network goes down, everything goes down. Do you know where the majority of all outages occur? At the network level. Do you know what the majority of things that people don't know? Networking. So we're adding a little extra networking to make sure that you guys get it. So when we're dealing with these direct connections, we basically have public and private interfaces. And why? If we get a public, so when we connect to AWS, we can use both public and private interfaces. Public interfaces enable access to all the AWS public services through the direct connection. Think like DynamoDB, SQS, public endpoints. So basically speaking, you're gonna need a publicly globally routable IP on both sides of your connections. So what happens is you set up one of these information, you do some BGP routing between yourself and basically the environment, and that's why you can share your routing information, and that will connect you to the AWS public services. Now, what about your own VPC? You get this great direct connection, you connect it to the direct connection location. As it goes through direct connection location, everything is up, everything is running. And this is now going to your, going to create a private wire back to your database, back to your availability zones, your data center. So that's what the public and private interfaces are. Public connects you to the public services like DynamoDB. Private connects you to the private services. So now you should have a good idea how these things work. Now remember, when you connect to AWS and you give them routes via BGP, and you must use BGP or Border Gateway Protocol when you're using a direct connection, you have minimal routing that the cloud provider will accept for you. They take about 100 routes. So if the cloud provider takes 100 routes, I want you to think about how seriously limited it is. It takes about three quarters of a million routes to get 
to connect to a single internet service provider if you're taking in a full routing table. So you've got that. So now let's say I've got an enterprise that's got 50,000 subnets and now you can only do 100 routes. You're gonna have to have the best, best, best IP addressing scheme to use this environment. You're gonna have to be able to route, summarize and do a lot of cool things. So if you're not a network architect, learn. If you don't know how to subnet and supernet, learn. Chris from my team can put a link to the subnetting video that we created. We did like a four hour subnetting session and it's really important to know this. So Chris from my team will pop a link to this video inside of the chat box for you. It may take them a minute or two to find it. I want you to go back and do that homework. If you're my students, you do it a lot. Like, guess what? We'll be talking a lot about BBP tonight and lots of networking things, but you've got to understand IP addressing. So please see that. So now let's talk about link aggregation groups. And then we were going to get out of this networking thing. And after the networking thing, we're going to get into storage, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. So, but I love networking. So you're with a networking person. You're going to be there. So let me see something. Um, Chris from my team says there is a question. So maybe we'll do a quick question before we cover the link aggregation group. Okay, let's see the question. Could not understand direct connection between a customer and an AWS router. Okay, so let's walk through this one more time before we talk about the VPNs. Um, let's look at it this way. In this particular environment, here's what you see. What you see is this is our data center. We've got a router or multiple routers. The router, we purchase a WAN link to the direct connection location. This is like an Ethernet over MPLS or an Ethernet wire. Immediately, that connects us to our router inside of a building. In that same building, the direct connection location, AWS has their routers. So basically, I buy a one gig link to this location, to my own router. AWS has their network, which goes all the way back to their environments. And all we're really doing is we connect to the, our location. A wire is run in the same building from our router to the AWS router. That's called a cross connect. And then AWS has network connections that go all the way back home. So that's what's going on. So I hope I answered your question there. So your options are direct connections or VPN connections. Direct connections you're going to use when you need high performance consistent bandwidth and consistent latency. Otherwise, you can do things. Now, there are other connectivity options that we can use kind of with direct connections, look like direct connections, like software-defined networking and MPLS-type connections and Ethernet over MPLS. But for you, the user, they're going to feel mostly the same. And once we start getting into that kind of stuff, we're dealing with CCIEs with 20 years of experience to truly understand how it works. So understand networking gets pretty complicated. Chris, was there any more direct connection questions before we go? Aside, Khan, is it something that is normally required in most use cases? In most environments that are going to need good network performance, they're going to have a direct connection and a VPN backup. So the answer is yes. Adam Say, would the organization have to set up direct connect every, to every availability zones or wants to connect to the cloud provider? So realistically speaking, you can connect to the cloud provider and you can over that, over that, you can create some virtual private connections to different environments. Great question, Adam Say. Excellent question. Does direct connection impact cost? Yes. Often, and typically speaking, direct connections cost more than in VPNs, but not always. See, when you're dealing with connections to the cloud, cloud provider connections are different than most connections. Typically speaking, at least in the US, if I buy a 10 gigabit connection between me and Alonzo, I pay for all 10 gigs, or I pay for the 10 gigabit connection. Let's say it's 10 grand a month for me to talk to Alonzo over the direct connection over our 10 gig link. Now, this is normal environment, normal networking. Now let's, so I pay $10,000 a month for Alonzo and our houses to be connected via the direct connection because he's a great cloud architect and I need to talk to him and consult with him on everything. So now everything's great. Now I only pay the $10,000 a month for the connection. 
Now, let's now look at this. What happens to the cloud provider? I pay 10,000 bucks a month for the connection. I then pay a port fee every day because I have the connection. And then I actually pay to use my connection. Wow. Pay for it, pay to have it, and then pay to actually use it. Okay, so, I mean, now we got something that gets pretty, pretty expensive. So, same thing with a VPN. We don't pay to get the connection, but we pay a port fee and we pay to use it. So, on certain cloud providers and certain use cases, if you use your data a lot, a direct connection not only can give you better performance, but it can be cheaper than the VPN. So, low use, direct VPN. High use, direct connection. So, direct connection can make it more expensive or cheaper based upon the use and the use case. So hope I answered your question there, Victor. High use, often cheaper direct connection. Low use, cheaper with the VPN. Okay, so understand. So Asad Khan, great question. So when we are dealing with a direct connection location, that's what you're doing. You're, cre you're connecting to a building that's got Amazon's equipment in it. That's why it's a direct connection location. So they've got lots of routers, lots of switches, firewalls, all kinds of cool stuff. You buy a connection to that building, and then you get a letter of uh, letter of authorization to connect your stuff in that building to that building. So Asad Khan, if you've ever heard of a point of presence on the internet, where basically all the internet service providers bring connect into a single building, and they run cables between their organizations, that's what we're talking about here. Exactly, exactly, exactly that. So I hope I made sense with that one. So, can you just connect the direct connect to a transit VPC? Well, a transit VPC, Robin, is when you're going to connect a whole bunch of VPCs for transit. That's not going to really give you direct connections to the cloud. So, if you had to do something, you could do it, but this is more of a connected data center to a cloud. Where a transit VPC is you've got multiple VPCs or multiple remote users, and you want to connect them to a specific service. This is for full connections to the cloud. This is going to enable you to manage your systems because you're never going to do something crazy like a bastion host when you, to, to actually manage your systems. If you're smart, you're going to use something like a VPN. And we'll talk about why we don't do bastion host later, why you might want to need to know it for the exam by why it's the worst possible reason in the world to manage your systems and why we would never do it in actual production, at least in environments that are secure and that actually matter. So Chris, was there any more of the specific connectivity ones before I go with the VPNs and before we get into the storage environment? Raj, you've got two options, direct connect and VPN. You're going to be using direct connections anytime that it matters. So they're the only two kinds of networking WANs that you really can exist. So you're going to be using a direct connection. Um, they're pretty easy. They just take a little bit of time, four to six weeks to set them up. Um, but that's the basis of all NAS networking. Well, Victor, in every case, when you're using a direct connection, it's always going to be a virtual connection because it's logical. Um, I, but I'll give you um, business cases where you would use it as opposed to a VPN. If if it's important to get access to your data, meaning it has to work, you have to use a direct connection because a VPN, chances are, won't be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So if it matters to connect to the cloud, you're going to be using a, a direct connection, not a VPN. If you're running any video, voice applications or data sensitive latency sensitive applications, you'll be using a direct connection by, via VPN. If you're charging, transferring large amounts of data, you will use it, be using a direct connection over a VPN. For 90% of environments that are high availability, a VPN is nothing more than a backup because it's just too slow and the performance is bad. Think of a VPN as something you put in a Starbucks. Starbucks, where the user is, where the cash register, where the barista is, if internet connections go down for 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, somebody doesn't get their coffee. Nobody dies. If you're, connect, if you're a bank and you're putting your information on the cloud, and the internet's down, millions of dollars are lost per minute, can't work. If you're a hospital and you want to make sure that your patient's medical records are on the cloud and the, and the internet's not guaranteed, somebody goes down, someone will die. So now you know. Direct connections. Anytime you're sending large amounts of data, anytime the cloud actually matters to you, anytime you actually need of latency sensitive services, that's when you're going to use a direct connection. So pretty much Every real environment that's not a micro, tiny, small business is going to use a direct connection. Okay, so I'm going to try and be Mr. YouTube for a minute. If you are enjoying this, please leave a like. 
And please do, if you're enjoying this content, push hashtag cloud hired in the chat box. And that way I know you're there. We like to know that people are there. We like to know that you hear us. We like to know that way that we're, we're making an impact. So please let us know. We'll do everything we can to try and help you in your cloud computing careers. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. The reality was this. I actually bought all the paid trainings for a person and I was so upset with what they were that we decided we're gonna do free AWS certification training, free Cisco training, and any kind of training we can do to help the community. So let's get you guys cloud hired. Realize most of what we do is basically we build cloud architects, we train them, we teach them business acumen, communication skills, presentation skills, architectural design skills. That's our world, not certification. But we've seen the certification courses out there and we figured it would be better for us to make an AWS full course tutorial or a free AWS training. And that's why we're doing this AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate 2022 bootcamp completely free. So I see lots of cloud hards, which means you guys are happy, which means I am happy because I want to give you the best experience, free, paid, it doesn't matter. We want you guys to have a lot of fun and learn so much. I've been an architect for decades, and let me tell you, it's the best thing I've ever done. And because of that, I want you guys to all share in the same experience that I've had. So let me go find my presentation because I'm because it went hidden. And let's go back to, to, to going to the content. So let's talk a little bit more of the concept of link aggregation groups. So here's the thing. If I buy two connections to the cloud, I can load share across both through complicated BGP uh, information. And tonight, if any of you guys want to take my intro to BGP class, we'll talk about load sharing across links without getting out of order packets. And it'll be cool, I promise you. I've spent 10,000 hours working on BGP long before I started teaching it. And I've been teaching it for decades. So BGP is cool. We'll play with lots of this. Um, so right now we're going to talk about a link aggregation group. I've seen some of the questions that are coming in, as I mentioned previous in the beginning. We're going to go for three hours per day, every day. We'll go today, we'll go tomorrow, we'll go the next day, the next day. And if we have to go through the weekend, we'll do it. Because we want to give you guys the best cloud computing AWS certified solution architect associate course, even though it's free. And that's why we're doing it free. We want you the best experience. So let's talk about link aggregation groups. What if I could take four links and bundle like four fingers and bundle them together as a single link? Instead of having this little one, this little one, this little one, I can bundle it together to look something like my forearm, bigger and stronger and more powerful. So that's called a link aggregation group. Link aggregation group, basically put a bunch of things together and make them look as one. One link aggregation group, one route in the routing table, one path. So, 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 so easy. I mean, this is exceptionally good. One route, one path, super, super easy. So now let's talk about this. A link aggregation work group bundles multiple things. So if you're going to put four links together, they must be the same bandwidth and the same latency. Because if I've got two links, this one is 10 milliseconds to the destination. This one's one millisecond. You see a problem? Our data is going to get there at different times, and it can't do that. So we need the same thing. So when you're using a link aggregation group, you're going to buy four connections or as many as four across the same service provider. So four, so this is like port aggregation protocol, exactly ether channel, same kind of concept. So when you put four links together in a single thing, chances are they're going to be from one service provider. So if you need redundancy and you're using link aggregation groups, you're going to have to do some certain things. So let's talk about, you know, what kind of redundancy you get with a link aggregation group. So let's walk through this because I really want you guys to understand. So let's say here we've taken two 10 gig connections and we've had two direct connections. So the top direct connection we have is across AT&T, across two, 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 two paths. And the bottom connection we have, as you can see, is across Verizon. So we've got two sets of environments, literally two, speaking, two sets of these environments. And because we've got two sets of these environments, um, realistically speaking, we've got backup. Now, why did we make the top link directly, specifically, specifically, specifically on um, the top link bundled together? And why are they all on Verizon? Because we have to have the same speed and latency. So the bottom one would be across another service provider. So this is the benefit of a link aggregation group. You've got multiple links and multiple sets of bandwidth. 
Now, if we only had a single link aggregation group, let's say the top one, note that there's two, two direct connections. So if any one of the connections, connections goes down in the link aggregation group, the connection will still up, stay up. So you could conceivably do four links from AWS um, to AWS through Verizon, four links through AT&T for a total of eight links. You could load share across them with a good BGP policy. And then after that, you've got backups. So this is really a high availability system. So that's the link aggregation group. So, okay, folks, we've covered the networking section, at least the connecting to the cloud. So now we're gonna talk about some really cool, some really fun stuff, storage. So prior to getting to storage, Alonzo, are you here? Alonzo, you're here. Because in the storage section, we're going to do a couple of cloud labs. Would you like to teach everybody that's here how to set up a budget in AWS? So if Absolutely. they want to do some of the follow along labs with you, nobody's going to get surprised by a big budget. So, Definitely, I would love to do that. So Alonzo is going to cover this. Alonzo is a fantastic cloud architect. As we architects, we typically don't configure, but Alonzo's got some exceptionally good I mean, exceptionally good cloud engineering skills in addition to him being a great cloud architect. So we're gonna have Alonzo demonstrate this. So Alonzo, I'd like you to teach everybody how to set up a budget. And then after that, we're gonna go talk about object storage, block storage, file storage, all kinds of cool stuff. So take it away, Alonzo. Okay, Mike, thank you so much. And uh, again, thank you everyone for joining this awesome opportunity, this awesome bootcamp. And uh, let me take you on a little bit of a journey with uh, AWS budgets and how we can avoid having a very, very possibly expensive uh, AWS service uh, bill. So one second while I switch over to, our, uh, to my pages. Excellent, thank you. For those of you that don't know, I've known Alonzo for a while now. Alonzo is a fantastic architect. He's got lots of great project management skills, lots of great leadership skills, got an MBA as well, so his business acumen is really solid. And he and I like to collaborate on a lot of things. So thank you so much, Alonzo. My pleasure, Mike. Okay, so can everyone see my screen? Okay, wonderful. Okay, so what Alonzo is gonna do is gonna set up a budget. What he's gonna do, and I strongly recommend before you do labs is as follows. Set up a budget so that you get notified when you're approaching a certain dollar volume. It's great doing things in the free tier. Set yourself a budget, maybe $25, maybe $50, whatever you can easily afford in case you get overages. You want to be notified. You don't want to get a ten dollars or $20,000 bill at the end of the month. So just always give yourself a budget. Okay. Come on, budget. We're having a little connectivity issues, but it seems to be working itself out. There you go. That's why organizations use direct connections and not VPNs. <laughs> Definitely, Mike. Okay, everyone. So once you um, initially create your own AWS uh, account, the first thing you do is that you're going to be going into your root account and you're going to be moving over to your billing dashboard. Now, right over here, or rather, you're going to be moving over to your um, to your account. I am sorry, because what you initially want to do is that you want to uh, enable the ability for your account through IAM to access your billing and to be able to dictate what your budget is, how you want to go about doing these things. So you're going to scroll down all the way to the IAM user enroll access to billing information. You're going to uh, edit that. You're going to activate your IAM access. It's very, very important. Otherwise, if you go into your AWS budgets, into your, um, not into your root user account because you never use that account for anything else other than setting up your account. But once you create admin user account, you're gonna be able to create any information with AWS budgets and you'll be able to do that from that perspective in that account. So, Excellent. So let me stop you there for one second. For those of you that are new to tech, identity and access management is about determining who the user is, what the user's allowed to do, and then tracking the information they did. 
We used to call it AAA, authentication authorization accounting. So when when uh, Alonzo is setting up the IAM for this to be able to make sure, he's, IAM is basically about determining who you are, what you can do, and then tracking it. So back to you, Alonzo. Absolutely, Mike. And once we uh, activate the IAM access, you're going to just press update just so that we can do the housekeeping. We're going to move over um, into our... Uh, our AWS budget and billing. So what we're going to do is we're coming, we're going to scroll down to budgets. Okay. Okay. And then we're going to be able to create, um, although I'm actually activated into um, an actual budget, you're going to be able to have an initial budget screen where you're going to be asked to create a budget yourself. And you're going to move over and scroll over to different variations, to, uh, various drop downs into these areas so that you might be able to uh, create your own budgets um, and set them accordingly to, um, you're going to put your own information down, um, your personal information, your payment information, um, the time and the allotment of that monthly budget that you want to have and how much money you want to spend there with. So in this instance, I have one already pre-made, Alonzo Coleman VPC budget. And as you can see, I, um, you have your details. I have the name of my budget. I have the budget amount that I allocated, which is $10. Um, the, uh, the budget type, which is, it, which is a cost budget, the expected amount of money that I want to spend on a period, which is a monthly basis. So as you can see, um, during this time frame, I have spent um, over the course of, of time, uh, this is the type of, of allocation that I've spent um, creating uh, various resources, spinning up various instances, so forth. Um, over this time frame. So as of October, I've budgeted for $10. The budget variance is six, uh, $9.65. And I've only spent an actual $0.35 cents out of my $10 budget. So the reason this is important to set this up is when you're doing things like, for example, my cat Cindy has turned on EC2 instances with her paws by walking over the keyboard and doing things like that. And you wanna know that your cat isn't turning on a 128 core server with four terabytes DRAM costing you eight bucks an hour and find out about it six months later. So, you know, my recommendation is always set up a budget, whether it's a lab environment or a real environment, because things can get really expensive on the cloud really fast. You know, you get paid to use your systems, you're paid to transfer your data, you're paid as you go through regions. So no surprises. Absolutely, Mike. And also, as as as, uh, as which is really helpful, um, creating your AWS budgets that you can also set up an alert for yourself either via uh, email, which it'll get to a eighty percent. You can set your your tolerances for say, for instance, you create this budget, you have your budget, and you only want to you want to be notified um, if there's a certain percentage before you get to your budget, and be able to be notified via. Uh, simple notification, which is um, a texting service, or prompt yourself with an alert um, to let you know that your budget is coming to a limit or um, if there's any issues there with uh, based on the parameters that you set. Thank you, Alonzo. My pleasure. You have any more to demonstrate on the budget piece? No, I do not at this time. If anyone else has any questions, please feel free. So if you guys have any questions on the budget that we're talking about, please ask them now. Otherwise, we're going to get into storage and we're going to have some cool labs when we hit storage. After we describe what is the storage, how does the storage work, why do organizations use the storage, those kinds of things. Okay. You guys got that? Fantastic. I don't see any questions popping up in the chat box. So if you guys can leave a like, it uh, helps all the algorithms do things. If you guys are enjoying this, please feel free to share the link to this with somebody else. So sharing is caring. So, you know, make sure you share it so other people, they'll be able to watch the uh, 
be able to watch the replay at any time they actually desire. So let's start talking about storage on the cloud. So what is storage? Storage is where the organization keeps their data. And guess what? All this compute we do, we're gaining information from all over the world. So this is really, really, really important that we store this information, not just storing the information. Can we analyze the data? Can we use the data? Can the data help us make better decisions? So prior to even thinking about storage, just think about this. If we can take in real-time data and make, in des make decisions better, guess what? We are in a position to make better decisions. Better decisions equal better business. Better business equals higher revenue. Higher revenue equals higher stock prices. Higher stock prices means more investment and growth to the company. So good, good news. So storage is important. So we're going to take this information. We're going to store it. We're going to aggregate it. And we're going to do lots of things. We can talk about things that you can do architecturally with the storage when you guys want. You guys can ask questions and we'll answer them. And remember, this is an AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate course. Obviously, we're going to give you some more information. We'll give you some of that Certified Solution Architect professional information and Certified Solution Architect associate information at the same time because you need more than just the associate. So we're going to give it to you, but you know, we're going to keep it as simple as possible because this is still our associate course. But so let's do this. Let's talk about storage. So when you're in the cloud, you're basically dealing with volatile storage and non-volatile storage. So let's talk about the difference. Volatile storage is this. If you set up a compute instance, and we'll talk about it, and you reboot it, all of your data is 100% gone overnight, instantly. Guess what? That's volatile storage. What if everything you did, you just stored it in memory, you rebooted the system, it was all lost? Might perform really, really great right now, but not really over the long term. Um, so... Obviously not a situation. So there's non-volatile storage, which is data that you store that's going to be stored for a long period of time. So, boy, so sorry to hear that, Jesse. $400 for playing with a computer instance. Horrible. So that's why you set up the budget. So volatile storage, things that go away with reboot. It's often, often called ephemeral storage. Non-volatile storage, storage that stays after a reboot upon instance termination. So... Let's look at it this way. Realize storage is a very, very, better critical component of your build. So when we talk about storage, we're gonna be talking about a couple kinds of storage. We're gonna talk about block storage, we're gonna talk about object storage, and we're gonna talk about file storage. And when we talk about file storage, we'll talk about things that are local to the computer, we'll talk about network file systems, we'll talk about uh, Windows file systems to really make sure you really get the concept of storage. So let's begin, and we're going to begin with block storage. Now, what is block storage? So block storage is a type of storage area network. Let me see this clear. It's a storage area network. This is not local storage in a computer. So what's it going to look like? You're going to have these giant RAID arrays, and they're going to be filled with so many hard drives. And basically speaking, you're going to have these highly redundant fault tolerant servers, if you will. They're not servers where you just, they're full of hard drives, hundreds and hundreds of hard drives, all in a storage environment in a RAID capacity. We'll talk a little bit about what RAID actually is, even though that's more of at the professional level, but it's critical knowledge. So you're going to have buildings or, that are full of storage. Now, what's unique about block storage is it takes the data and it breaks it down into the blocks. So data here then a block. Now, each block is going to have its own unique block identifier, something that helps you identify the block. So block storage is network storage. So what do you think the throughput limitation is of block storage? The network interface speed. So if you've got a 10 gigabit Ethernet connection, the fastest block storage you're going to get access to is 1,000 megabit a second, which isn't that fast. But it's network storage. It's not local storage. So remember, with block storage, the network is your performance limitation. So if you buy an NVMe drive at Best Buy, a Gen 4 for 100 bucks, it's going to give you about 5,000 megabit per second. The fastest EBS volume can't get above 1,000 megabit per second. Why? It's not something that AWS did wrong. It's because it's limited by that 10 gig link. Now, when we talk about block storage, 
we're also gonna talk about lower performance than storage in the data center. Why is it lower performance? It's this network performance. And when we're dealing with latency and speed, we'll talk about it, but block storage on the cloud is much, much, much slower than instant storage and much, much, much slower from the cloud. But block storage is gonna be our fastest, highest performance storage that we can actually use on the cloud. So we're gonna be using it. So you got your data, it gets broken down into blocks. Now why cloud providers love block storage is as follows. The blocks or the data can be placed wherever it's the most efficient anywhere in your environment. So block storage, realistically speaking, decouples your storage from your compute environment. I'm gonna say that again. Block storage decouples your storage from your compute environment. So why is this so cool? You can put your servers anywhere, anywhere. You can keep your storage anywhere. So it's fast, it's efficient, and it scales. It's not like you need to put all your hard drives in the server. You can do it anywhere, anywhere in your environment. So I hope that makes sense for you. That's why cloud providers love block storage. Now let's talk about block storage and you know and why it's so unique block storage is excellent for files that change frequently so think of an environment you've got a server server has a swap file which is basically virtual memory server has got all these little mini caches and little files that are going through constantly making new versions block storage is really great for data that changes frequently so block storage is perfect Perfect, literally 100% perfect for an organization to use to store their data. So in the cloud environment, you're gonna be using block storage, you're gonna mount it to a server, and it's gonna look and feel exactly what like real storage. So block storage, remember this, very important. Takes your data, breaks it down into blocks, each block's got its own identifier, it can be placed anywhere in the environment where it works. Block storage decouples your user data from your compute environment, and it scales very well. Now, the next type of computing storage that we're gonna use in the cloud is object storage. Don't get worried, we'll get to the AWS specifics. Why am I teaching you so much about block storage and object storage first? If you wanna be a cloud architect, you're gonna to have to talk to the customer about their storage. They're not gonna care about the term or where it's S3. They wanna know about their storage. So I want you to understand the storage. Guess what? If you're working with another cloud provider other than AWS, I still want you to know what to do. I'm not gonna train you to drive a Mercedes. I'm gonna teach you to drive a car. So you can drive a Mercedes, a BMW, a Porsche, a Lexus, a Ford, a Chevy, and everywhere in between. So now you know about block storage. Now the next kind of storage that's used all over the cloud is something called object storage. Object storage is really cool storage. Object storage takes data and it breaks down the data and puts them into objects. So break your data, convert it to an object. Now why object storage is so cool and why it's used everywhere is when your data is broken down into objects, it's got its own object ID. And each object actually has some metadata or data about the data referencing it. So think about it this way. You've got your data and a whole lot of information about what is the data. Again, I wanna make you really think about this. You've got your data and an incredible amount of information about your data. So object storage is cool. You wanna find information, search for it with object storage. You wanna look at part of an object instead of all the data? You can, because you've got an identifier and metadata. You wanna create a large data environment that an organization can use for machine learning? Object storage has metadata. Because it has metadata, you can create things like a data lake. Object storage is really, really good for static files. Object storage is not regular storage. It is used for static files. Every time with object storage, you touch or modify a file, it creates a new version. Now there's a difference between AWS versioning and native object storage, but object storage by default creates a new version. Anything sometimes is modified even 1% or a half a percent or an eighth of percent. So object storage is terrible for files that change frequently because it'll create too many objects, fill up your storage, cost you a fortune. So object storage is used for write once, read many time data. So object storage, 
data, broken down into objects, objects have their own identifiers, and objects have metadata or data about the data. So because of this, object storage is great for big data environments. And we'll talk about the AWS specific ones, don't worry. Now let's talk about file storage. So what is file storage? You got a hard drive on your computer? It's file storage. When you're at work and you map to a shared drive on Windows on the server, file storage. If you're on a Unix and Linux system and you're all sharing their shared network storage on NTFS, guess what? File storage. So file storage is where you store files. Object storage, your data is broken down into objects, and block storage, your data is broken down into blocks. And that's it. So now you know the basic three types of storage, block storage, file storage, and object storage. So prior to getting into S3, which we're going to do next, which is object storage, does anybody have any quick questions on storage? Let me know if you guys have any quick storage questions. And if you do, um, I, uh, realistically speaking, would, uh, would like to hear them before we go on. So, Babita, what is the difference between a database and storage? Great question. Storage is where you store everything. So on your computer, you take your pictures, for example, your videos, your Word documents, that is storage, stuff you're going to store in storage. A database is a little different. A database is basically an application that enables you with relational databases to share objects that are related to each other. A database is a structured way to basically have like names, email addresses, prices when person used. So realistically speaking, a database is to store specific stuff and be searchable and be queryable, or storage is where you store everything. So for example, let's take it out of the computer, Babita. Let's say in your house, you've got a closet, that's storage, you just throw stuff in there. Now, let's say you had an organizer, and the organizer, you had columns and rows, and you just pop things in an organized manner, like the top shelf has all spices, the next shelf was all sweeteners, the next shelf was all something. That's more like a database, structured, ordered environments of things. So storage where you throw everything Think about a closet. Think about a database as a structured ledger. When you go to your checkbook and you actually see the writing down, you know, who you wrote a check to and what it was and the date and the time, that's like a database. Now, the bank account that you have where the money actually exists, that's actually about storage. So, you know, hope we answered your question there, Babito. I think there may be a few questions. Um, I know they're coming in. So the next question, uh, one of the questions that I actually saw was when to use file storage, Dan T DTM, and when to use object storage. So Dan, for files that change frequently, use block storage. For housing and operating system, use block storage. If it needs to be utilized by a computer, you use block storage. If by comparison, Perez the dev, you want to create a video and distribute that video to a lot of people, that is object storage. If you want to create a software artifact and distribute that to many people, that is object storage. If you've got photos, videos that you write once and you share many, that is object storage. So if it's mounted by a server, it's going to be file storage or block storage. If it's for software distribution, all you need to do, for example, is uh, use object storage. So that's typically when you're using them. Chris, if you want to bring up the next question. Object storage is not exactly like an unstructured database, but realize that object storage has data or metadata about data. And it's typically, the it's a flat storage environment where basically what happens, it's very much like a database where you've got a pointer to the actual data. And realistically speaking, in many cases, you can actually run SQL queries on data stored on object storage. So in a lot of ways, it's unstructured like a database, but if you need a real database for unstructured, that's loosely flexible and scales, you're gonna use a NoSQL database, such as MongoDB, Apache Cassandra, that kind of thing, um, just so you guys know. Chris, if you wanna bring in uh, the next uh, question. Okay, well, 
Um, Mario Millen, can you explain rate after consistency for new objects versus eventual consistency? Yes, Mario, we're going to talk a lot about this when we get into the database section, but here's the thing. Immediate consistently means if I store it right now somewhere and a tenth of a second later you decide to look at it, it's going to be there. Eventual consistency, Mario, is as follows. I put something there. Three seconds later, you might still see the old version. Five seconds later, the new version is there. That is when you call I'm eventually consistent. Eventually consistent scales much, much, much more than immediately consistent. But yes, uh, that's how it works. So uh, what is the difference between the professional and the associate exam? Here's the answer. The associate exam is relatively basic, although the questions they ask can be tricky because the questions are worded trickly. The professional exam, the questions are much deeper and they are very convoluted. The, the associate exam is very straightforward. They ask you a question, there's pretty much an obvious answer. The professional exam, they ask you a question that's four paragraphs long. The hardest part of the professional exam is really reading those questions because reading those questions the way they're written is a huge challenge. So on the professional exam, I'd say the hardest part of it is actually reading the question and understanding the question. Once you do that, there's four answers and the answers are much more complex. So associate is definitely easier. The way we're running this course right now is a hybrid between an associate and a professional because there are certain things that are not covered in the associate which you'd never be able to work without. And because of that, we're covering it here in our version of an AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate. So we're going to give you about 25 to 30 or 40 percent more than you would need because we want you to be hireable. We want you to be great, not just certified. Getting certified is different than getting cloud hired. We're about getting cloud hired. So we're going to have a slightly different take on certain things that we do. So. We're architects, so because I've been a cloud architect, a network architect, an enterprise architect, and our team's full of architects, we want to focus on those things. So we gave you a little extra. Any other questions before we go back? Okay, Rizwana, if you need to mount storage to multiple servers, you're using network file system or Windows file storage. So you're using file storage for that, generally speaking because you're not going to mount object storage or S3 to a server. It's for backup and archival purposes. So I'm going to do as many real time questions as we can in real time. Um, can't do everyone because we, so we can keep you on track, but I will try and do as many as we can. And guess what? I've got lots of question and answer sessions going on. And again, just a reminder, everybody this weekend, we are on Friday. We have the, we have IT Excel, one of the best, technology recruiting firms in the country. They're going to bring in their executives. They're going to answer your questions. And of course, you'll have the opportunity to send them your resume. And they're going to be coming back every other week with us. Last week, we had a VP of NVIDIA. A couple of weeks before that, we had an executive over at Bursa Networks. And you know what? We're going to make sure we bring you somebody else that's really special very, very soon. But this week, lots, lots, and lots of executive recruiters coming in. And tonight, also some free BGP training. We'll get there. We'll do a little bit more about AWS BGP than you guys would probably want to know, but it's great skill to have. So let's go back to storage, everyone. Now I'm having fun with storage. I hope you guys are having fun. If you're having fun, if you can type cloud hired in the chat box and or leave a like, keep the algorithms happy, everyone. So where are my slides that I was looking at? I know they're here somewhere. One of these days, I'm actually going to learn how to use a Windows computer. Okay, bear with me a second. Okay, well, maybe my PowerPoint window went open. Okay, no. Bear with me while we deal with the live technology problems associated with Windows. Okay, bear with me while I do this. So please uh, type the words cloud hired in the short time. And why can't I open PowerPoint? Bear with me one minute. We'll be back while you guys are typing cloud hired. Um, where is PowerPoint? Bear with me.
gotta love tech issues when they when they get you what you need. Okay, so let's maybe end this and let's kind of launch it again. Okay, why don't I have any PowerPoint here? Like none. Well, this is really fun. Okay, bear with me, guys. I don't know why I can't seem to access my slides at all. Or my OBS environment. Okay, so we've got this. We're now halfway here. Okay, just a little bit of tech and we, we need to be good to go. My tech is 100% crashing right now. So guys, um, you know, I was using a Mac for, for years and it uh, did not work with uh, my system. So Alonzo, could you do start with the next lab and actually set up an S3 bucket? And then I'll talk about an S3 bucket as soon as I do a system reboot. That sounds wonderful, Mike. I can definitely take that. Okay, okay, so I'm going to do a system reboot. You do the first AWS S3 um, lab, and I will be right back. Okay, sounds good. Okay, everyone. I hope that you can see my screen or that it will there. I guess that means I get some screen time now, Alonzo. <laughs> That's what it seems like, Chris. <laughs> okay. Does everyone see my, hopefully everyone sees my uh, AWS management console. We're going to start here focusing on S3. So we're going to click into that S3 management console. Now, right here, I've already illustrated, we've, uh, Mike has already discussed um, what object storage is, which is what S3 is. So right here, you can see my account snapshot. You can see the buckets that I've already created. But I'm going to go through a quick walkthrough with everyone so that you can see for yourself the steps that it takes to get to a certain point. So initially, um, buckets, um, they're kind of like folders um, where you can put all your content in. You can put uh, your object storage into these buckets. Uh, one thing about buckets is that you have to understand is that when you create them, it has to have a universal uh, naming convention, which means there's no other name like this on the planet. And I believe, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure about it, that you have up to 63 characters to create these naming conventions. And it can only use, uh, use dashes or dots, no other type of uh, special characters. So I'm going to create a uh, create bucket for you right now. And we're going to call it um, Google Cloud Careers Bootcamp Bucket. And I am in the East 2 area in the good, great state of Texas. So where we are right now is that when it when it asks you to prompt if you want to block public asset access settings for your bucket, you have to do this. Otherwise, everyone that you ever thought possible in the entire world can ask, access all of your content within your bucket. So you want to make sure that this particular uh, uh, check mark is uh, checked so that you can ensure your security. Bucket versioning. So this is a real fun piece that I really like. So say, for instance, as, um, as a former marketing creative, um, we always did varying uh, versions of creative pieces. Um, um, if you create a certain file and you have to adjust that file and it's going to be different, you're not going to be writing over the same file over and over and over again based on those iterations. So when you enable versioning, you can create a certain file and then you can create the same file but with a different look and you can upload it into S3 and it will still provide the same naming convention but a different version of that so that you can always keep incremental track of what you upload into the bucket. So you can also um, disable or enable encryption, uh, which we, Mike, will get into that later on about the different encryption practices that S3 has available, uh, whether it's server-side, uh, server customer-side encryption, 
and how we can create that there with. So now we're at a point where we can create the bucket. So now I've created uh, GC's Google Cloud, uh, Google Cloud course, oh my goodness, um, um, GCC Bootcamp, um, which would, you know, which is the uh, actual uh, bootcamp that I've made, um, bucket that I've created. So we can go inside the actual objects. Now we have an opportunity to upload um, certain uh, content here. So what I'll do is that I'll add um, some creative pieces that I've, I've done previously or some files that I've made. For the GoCloud careers bucket. And so we have the actual logo right here in both JPEG and PNG form. So we're going to take those two pieces and we're going to add it into the Dropbox. So now I just clicked and dragged these two items right here into the folder, and now I can upload them. So now we have upload succeeded complete. And so we have these two files for Google Cloud Career um, JPEG that we can um, access at any point in time um, for any other examples or anything else. So now I can add um, the same item because I, I, I added versioning and I can go and upload something else. So let's go back into the Google, um, Google I'll keep saying the same thing, uh, the GoCloud careers uh, bucket and we can upload some more content. So now I can add files. I can go to back to this uh, particular bucket. And let's go and upload the same thing. So now right here you can look. And you can see all the information about where your where your S3 bucket is, well, where your content is within this particular bucket. You can focus on the region, which is where I, I put it. You have your S3 URI, which you can use for pre-signed URLs. Um, you have your, um, uh, your Amazon resource naming convention, and you have your object uh, URL again right here. And so we can click on this. So now you notice that once I clicked on it to try to access it, because we blocked it off to the entire world, we have access denied. So it, it has that real solid encryption um, so that you can keep, make sure that all your um, content within your buckets are secure. So let's go back to our Go Cloud careers bucket. So right again, we have our properties. We can enable or we can suspend, um, you know, the options for S3 based on um, what you're, you know, if you want to write over things or if you can't, and then you can also add another layer of uh, security with multi-factor authentication. Now, using this, you can modify these settings using command line, or you can use software de uh, development kits or S um, uh, or um, APIs to do so. Now, keep in mind, um, an MFA is very similar to what you would use when you initially have a AWS uh, account. You set that up as another means of uh, not only accounting and authority, but to create that layer to ensure that no one else can get into your account. And you have different variations of using MFAs such as Authy or Google Authenticator, or you can actually use Microsoft Authenticator. Authenticator, rather. All right, I am going to add Mike back in real fast. Okay, wonderful. Hey, Mike. Yes, I am back. I'm so operating I, on two different systems right now, so it's going to be a neat experience until I reinstall my <laughs> operating system. For those so, of you that don't know, I've been a Mac user forever, 
And what ultimately happened is when we started shooting 6K video for you, the Mac, my 16 core, 192 gig of RAM Mac couldn't handle the load. So we switched over to a Windows thing and now I'm learning all the fun about Windows. So um, we're up, right. we're here and I'll go back and let's talk about uh, S3. Did you want me to try sending you the Google Slides? Or do you just want to go with Send me uh, the Google Slides and I will use them and I'll be excited to use them. In the meantime, I'm just going to work off of my notes. All right. So we've got a couple of questions if you want to look through the uh, chat box. Yeah. Um, I, I, while, let me try and find while, the chat box. Uh, while I'm, look, while I'm looking for the uh, Google Slides. So, you got it. Let me answer some questions. I will ask her some questions. And then after that, we will have a party because I love teaching. And, you know, part of the life is things happen, adapt, improvise, and overcome. So let's look some of the questions that were actually here um, and the reason. So so realistically speaking, so SM7, you know, one of the scariest things that is in general, when things are designed out of the box, they can either design to be closed out of the box or open out of the box. So what I mean by that is a system that is closed out of the box will be locked out and secure. If you go buy a firewall from Cisco, it's going to default to block everything by until true and otherwise. But some things are configured open until you lock them down. So that's up to you, the architect, and up to the vendor to determine how they do their policy. So um, the next question, um, um, I can't really see who was asking all the questions because I was off doing system reboots. Um, but... Uh, you have I see B3 collector several buckets. That's great. That's pretty normal. Um, yeah, we typically don't uh, plan for breaks on these things because of the amount of length. I love doing breaks, but what I found out when we do breaks on live stream, people just don't come back. Plus, it's also really hard for people to watch the live streams at the break after the fact. So um, if you need to disappear for a few minutes, pause the video, come back and watch it. We're thrilled, still thrilled to have you here. It'll, it should be great. Um, so... Um, somebody said they're currently a DevOps developer. That is fantastic. We love hearing that. That is terrific. Um, not an architect, very different career. Um, and Chris, I just requested access to that thing you just sent me. So let's go to the next question while we're waiting for that. Um, who has the next question? You are DevOps and okay, so S3 is great for backups. That's what people typically use object storage because it's cheap. Um, and it's very good for object storage. Justin Lee, yes, I, S3 does provide, you know, relatively high availability. I wouldn't call it high availability because it's 99.99% available, which is somewhat high availability, but I would consider five nines available or greater to be high availability because four nines availability means your storage is not going to be there for almost an hour per year. I don't consider that high availability. I consider that moderate availability. High availability means five nines availability means you'll have five minutes of downtime a year where you can't access your storage. So AWS calls it high availability. I consider it moderate availability, but the durability of the AWS data is fantastic. So let's try and see if I have access to these slides, if I can share them. Otherwise, I will just go ahead and do them off of my notes. I've been doing them that way for years and years and years, um, and it works typically well, but we're trying new tech. We're going from Microsoft Office to Google Slides and hoping that it works along the way. So what is AWS S3. AWS S3, or simple storage, is object storage that's available on the AWS platform. So object storage. Remember what we talked about with regards to object storage. We said that object storage is great for environments where you write once and read many times. Now, AWS would tell you that their object storage is high availability by calling it 99.99% .99 available. That means that your data may have upwards of 52 minutes of downtime per year. So if you consider that to be high availability, then yes, you can consider that to be high availability. But AWS S3 does, which is really awesome, is their service is super, super high durability, meaning it's 99.9999999% durable, which means 99 plus, to take 99 to 11 place is total. Now, that is some pretty good durability. What does that mean if you're the architect? It means that once you store your data on AWS, it may not be available exactly when you need it because you're going to have 52 minutes of downtime per year, but it's not going to be lost. 
your data is really, really safe. And this is extremely, extremely exciting to be able to do these kind of things. So, you know, when we're talking about it, I think this kind of environment is really, really kind of cool. So let's see how we kind of do these kind of things. Chris, what do I need to be able to share slides from another window in OBS? Do I do a screen capture or something? Um, you will do a window. Uh, at, click the go on the sources, hit plus and window. Okay, so I've got some slides that we can share with you guys. Plus window capture. We'll click window caption and somewhere along the line, it's okay, excellent. Now so, just move it around and get it get it to look pretty. <laughs> around and get it to look pretty. We can do that. I have that capability. So if I make it a little bigger, hopefully, do we make can we can we expand the size of it for everybody? Does that improve it? Okay, so we will okay, we're gonna work with this to the best of our abilities as Google Slides for the rest of the day. Okay, we've got we've got something we can work on. Okay, fantastic. So AWS, object storage, object storage that we're talking about. And we are also talking about um, being 99.999% available. How do I go back to this? I don't. Okay, we're going to get rid of this window capture. And we're going to go back to where we were at. See, when you're an executive, you need a team of really great engineers and architects around you to help you with these things. So let's talk about why an organization would use S3. Backing up, for example, the organization's data would be a good use case for something like this. Um, for example, static website hosting, distribution of content, media, software, disaster recovery planning, or big data analytics. So let's think of it. Backup, write once, read several times. Sure, totally makes sense. Static website, same content, never going to change. Sure, it comes out of object storage. You want to distribute a video or a movie or new software? Use the cheap storage. I write it once, it gets read many times. I want to take my entire data center and back it up. Object storage is cheap. Great. Disaster recovery planning. Make copies of the images of all my servers. Simple storage, S3. Fantastic. So now you know why organizations are using S3, because it's really cool and it offers a tremendous amount of benefits to the customer. So now let's talk about the way it works. When you're dealing with AWS S3, your data is gonna be organized into buckets. Now, realistically speaking, when you're dealing with a bucket, it's not exactly a bucket that you're actually dealing with. What you're actually dealing with is that is, uh, you know, what looks like a bucket, which is basically a pointer pointing to your data. Now, what's pretty cool in the way this stuff works is as follows. Um, when you're dealing with this kind of stuff, you're, you're finding yourself in a situation where your bucket has a DNS name. So you can reach the content in your, in your bucket by just putting the fully qualified domain name. So realistically speaking, your, your data is just a pointer. It's really just a pointer to the data that you're actually receiving. So now you know a little bit more about the way S3 works and it's realistically speaking pointers to the data. So let's talk about you know, some options that you have with regards to AWS to make object storage work for you. You put your data in a bucket and you're gonna to need to secure your data. If an organization has mission critical data and if the mission critical data gets breached, you got a problem. So you only want people that have a need to know the data to actually get the data. So you're gonna secure your data in the cloud. You're gonna secure it in one of the following options. You can create a bucket policy, which is the preferred method. You're gonna create a bucket policy and it's gonna use the identity and access management functions of the cloud. And by creating the bucket policy on the cloud, you can be very granular. Alonzo can access this. Chris can access this. Jesse can access this. Amit can access this, Jeremy can access this, Abigail can access this, and we love that. And that's a bucket policy. The alternative, if you wanted something a little simpler, is you could just create something called an access control list. Now, realistically speaking, this is not the kind of access control list like you would be using to keep traffic out of a subnet. This is a totally different kind of access control list. This kind of access control list that we're talking about is basically read, write, or full control. 
Now, can you guys hear a giant fan or a jet engine sound? Because I'm working on my backup workstation right now, which has got some pretty bad fans, so apologies. Hopefully, the, the sound isn't that loud. So let's talk about tiers of data on the cloud. So when you're dealing with organizations and data, you're going to deal with the following things. Most data is, is dynamic for a period of time. So let's look at it this way. Organizations may have fresh data. And if I get fresh data, I may use that data every single day of the week, literally every day for a month. And then I might not touch it at all. So we can actually get different tiers of data storage inside the cloud. We're going to talk about multiple options and multiple speeds and qualities and ways to access your information. So we're going to talk about S3 standard, which is traditional object storage, the standard way that it works. We'll talk about Amazon S3 and frequent access. And yes, you need to know this. This will be all over the exam. We will talk about S3 and frequent access one zone. We will talk about S3 intelligent cheering, and we will talk about AWS S3 Glacier. All matter, and you need to know these all for the exam. So let's now talk about the standard S3. Standard S3 is high availability, high durability, high performance storage. This is standard. So you're going to use this for any kind of data that you frequently access. I've got data I want to access every day. I'm going to put it in S3 standard, best performance, highest availability, highest durability, and that's what we're going to use. Highest price, but you can access your data as often as you need to. So now we know those kind of things. So after that, we've got another kind of storage, and that's going to be called S3 one zone. All right, let's go to S3 and frequent access before we do S3 and frequent access one zone. What is S3 and frequent access? It's basically the same S3 that you had before, but it's designed if you're not going to use your data very frequently. So what is as follows? So S3 is your normal bucket. But what if you could put your data into a separate bucket for data that you don't use a lot? So S3 and frequent access does just that. It gives an organization the following. High performance, high availability data, just like before. Same durability, just as before. But now you pay reduced prices, almost half of traditional fees. But you actually have to pay to access your data. So before you had your data and you paid and you paid nothing, but you paid twice as much for the data. With S3 and frequent access, you may basically pay half of the data, but you pay to retrieve your data. So normal S3, frequently access content. But S3 infrequent access is have your data and you pay to receive it, but you pay half to keep it there. So infrequent access is really great for files that you need to use occasionally. Store your data, it's effectively almost half price. Pay a retrieval fee. So look at it this way. If you have your data you're gonna access all the time, keep it in standard S3. When you're not gonna access it that frequently, move it over to S3 infrequent access. This is called lifecycle management. We'll explain it in much, much, much more depth. So next, let's talk about the storage tiers. So we're gonna do the next storage tier, which is infrequent access one zone. So for organizations that want low cost, the low cost of infrequent access, they can have it. But what if an organization is saying, hey, we don't need high availability storage. We can tolerate reduced availability. That's what this S3 one zone is. It's you pay, for data to access that you don't need that much that's less critical because it becomes less available. So if it's lower available, your data is only stored in one availability zone, you get a cheaper price, but it's only there if you don't need it. So don't put information in S3 and frequent access one zone if you might need the information in your business day. It doesn't have sufficient availability, but it's cheap. So S3, standard data, frequently accessed. S3 and frequent access, data that you're not going to frequently access. So um, one zone uh, is used for data that you're not going to frequently access, that if you can't access it when you need it, nobody cares. So now you kind of know. So realistically speaking, that's where you, that's what you really want to go for. 
So with regards to storage tiers, AWS has something called intelligent tiering. You probably will see it on the exam. Here's what intelligent tiering is. You put your data on AWS and they automatically move it to wherever it's cheapest based upon a machine learning algorithm. So in life, in architecture, here's kind of the thing. Here's what you do. You basically, store, you manually intervene whenever possible because you get the best results. But if you don't know your data patterns, and I suggest a good architect should learn those data patterns. But if you don't know your data patterns or it's you know random and hard to figure out, we are dealing with some really cool stuff with this S3 intelligent tiering because realistically speaking, that's the way you can deal with this. So but it'll do it automatically for you, automatically, those kind of things. So now let's talk about some other tiers. Let's talk about Glacier. So pretend that you use standard S3 for data you need all the time and you use infrequent access for data that you need that often. Now, what if you wanted even cheaper data storage, even cheaper data storage, but this data that you're going to store for a much cheaper option is as follows. You don't need to access it and you can wait eight hours for it. So organizations do this all the time. They'll have their data go straight from S3 and they'll keep it there for a month or two months or however long they're going to use the data. Then they'll migrate that data to infrequent access. And then after like say 90 days or 180 days, whatever it is in their business, when they know they're not going to use the data, but they want to store it for archival purposes or, or auditing purposes or future machine learning purposes, they can migrate that data to Glacier. Glacier is another form of S3. It is the lowest cost. You pop your data in here and it is locked down. That's what Glacier is for. So realistically speaking, and then I'll go back and answer some of these questions in the chat box. Realistically speaking, because I see some misconceptions, especially going on with regards to storage. Realistically speaking, once it's in Glacier, you pay to retrieve it. And, but it's the lowest cost. So life cycle policy, S3, then to infrequent access, then to Glacier. Now there are some environments and some businesses that are really, really, really regulated, such as banking, such as healthcare, realistically speaking. So um, if you're in one of these environments that's regulated, you may be forced to save information in an unmodifiable way. So if I take care of one of my patients in the hospital, let's say I'm not pretending to be a cloud architect today and I'm pretending to be a medical professional today. I'm equally comfortable practicing internal medicine, designing cloud architectures, network architectures, it doesn't matter. So let's look at it this way. Um, let's say that we wanted to do it this way. Um, I forget actually what we're talking about here. So, but look at your data in your tier. So let's say you've got this bank and they can't, modify their files they need something um and we and, and we have and they need something that's going to realistically be unmodifiable immutable if you will chat transcripts at a bank medic patients medical records you've got to store this stuff for three years or seven years you can use something called glacier deep archival purposes it creates a fault and you can guarantee that no files have been modified along the way so in those kind of interesting things, we were making sure that you understand this. So lots of options. Standard, S3 standard, frequently accessed information. Two, um, infrequent access for files you don't need that frequently. Glacier for things that you almost never need. And for files that you need to stay unmodifiable for a long period of time, what you are going to use is as follows. You're going to use Glacier Deep Archive. So now you know the types of things that are available. So let's go back into that lifecycle management component one more time. What is lifecycle management? It's about putting your data where it's most efficient at the best price at the best time. We'll have slides for you again tomorrow. So what does this mean? Send your data to S3, go to infrequent access, and then go to Glacier. So realistically speaking, that's what we're talking about. Now, I want you to think about a couple of concepts. Remember what I told you about object storage. Every time you modify a file, it creates a new version. Every single time. So if, for example, you had a swap file of an operating system and you could use a swap file on the cloud, do you know what it's going to do? 
it's going to create a new version every millisecond. So if you had a 64 gig swap file and it creates a new version every millisecond, you would have 64 gigs a thousand times per second in your object storage. So guess what? Object storage is only good for files that are static. So realistically speaking, but now let's say that you want a lot of redundancy. Sometimes object storage can be your friend. So for example, let's say I was writing a Word document with 30 people on it. Each person made a modification, but I want each one to overwrite the original. No, I'd want a new version. So object storage, every time you touch or modify a file, it's going to create a new version of that, right? New version. So guess what? Because of this, S3 has something called versioning, which is the default nature of object storage and enables you to keep multiple copies. So there's that. So S3 versioning enables you to basically create multiple versions, which is the default functionality of object storage, although AWS gives it to you as a additional feature that you can enable. So now let's talk about multi-factor authentication, something you have and something you know. So if, for example, what you're trying to do this, what you're trying to do is as follows. You want to delete data. Imagine what happens when you delete data. Do you think it's really safe deleting data? Like, you know, let's say I'm on my computer and I just drag a folder to the trash by accident and it was all gone. That would be problematic. What if it's an organization's mission critical data? Mission critical data and I accidentally delete it. That's a problem. What if a hacker gets into my systems and wants to delete data maliciously? Not really good, right? So let's look at it this way. Versioning can protect us against these things and by keeping multiple versions and multi-factor authentication delete saves us. So here's what multi-factor authentication delete is. I go to delete Alonzo's PowerPoint slides. I then get a text message that, or, that says, did you authorize this? Enter your one-time password. I enter a one-time password and I'm authenticated. Now, whether I'm using a Google Authenticator app um, or whether I'm using a text message, it's really irrelevant. Multi-factor authentication does as follows. I go to delete something. I receive a challenge for a one-time password. I provide that password and it's deleted. So think about this multi-factor authentication delete and all the cool stuff that it does. Let's look at it holistically. Cool factor one is as follows. Hacker breaks in, they try to delete it, and poof, guess what? It goes to me. I don't delete it, my data is not deleted. So really cool factor of multi-authentication delete. I go to accidentally delete my files, it's no big deal. An angry employee wants to leave the company, wants to delete everything, they try and do it, it sends me the message, and guess what? They're denied. So, multi-factor authentication delete can really, 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 really help you there. So now you know. So let's talk a little bit about more, and then we're going to do a little more questions than usual to, excuse me today because we don't have any slides, and I realistically would like to give you more slides. Um, so we'll figure that out on our end. We'll make sure our slides are back for tomorrow. We'll have cool slides back for our BGP session tonight, absolutely, in every way, shape, or form. So let's work with you here. So now you know about multi-factor authentication delete. So let's do this. Let's talk about one more thing, and then uh, we're going to go to some questions. So remember, object storage is not traditional file storage. It is flat. It is basically almost a database-like structure. You've got your data, and you have a pointer to your data. So that's there. So it's not really files and folders. So if you guys are going to create a delimiter to make it look and feel like a folder, remember, it's not a folder. It's in any way stretch of the imagination. It just looks and feels that way. So if I created a mic at, bucket that said Mike slash 2021 slash AWS videos slash storage slash S3.mp4, it's not going to be hierarchical. I may map to that location like I would on a regular computer, but it is not hierarchical because it's just a pointer. So realize your data in object storage is flat. 
It is not hierarchical. It is flat. So kind of work with that, kind of understand. Um, apologies, you know, we're working off of slides on a, on a backup notebook workstation trying to stream off of something else. Things happen in tech, and you know what? That's why you adapt, improvise, and overcome. So, Chris, why don't we aggregate and take some questions? And then after we take the questions, we will figure out exactly uh, the next thing to do. We can talk about encrypting S3, but Chris, if you want to bring up some questions. I'm going to bring up one question that seemed to spur a lot of conversation in the chat box, which I think you referenced earlier about maybe being some questionable stuff in there. So I just, I'm going to pop on the original question that spurred that conversation. Excellent. It's very simple, surprisingly. Excellent. <laughs> Memory in Ceph, what is the difference between block and object storage? Okay, well, one of my more favorite things to talk about. We talked a lot a little bit, but let's talk about it again. So object storage takes data, breaks it down into objects. Now, each object has metadata or data about the data. So object storage being a type of storage error network technology takes data, breaks it down into objects. Now, each object has metadata. So it's that metadata, which is really the data about the data, that makes object storage so useful and so cool. So take your data, break it down into objects. Now, object storage is useful memory for data that does not change. Static data, website data is perfect for object storage. Object storage does not get mounted or used by computers. It's not real storage at all. So it's not like you're gonna have your computer map to it over iSCSI as a rule and use it as now you can do something called the gateway, which is gonna make object storage feel like real storage, but it's not. Object storage is that type of storage area network. So performance limitations, the speed of the storage area network, <coughs> scalability limitations, the number of hard drives you can put in your storage array. Guess what? You can take multiple storage arrays and glue them together so object storage scales well. Block storage scales equally well. So object storage, static files, takes your data, breaks down into objects. Each object's got metadata. Think write once, read many. Think about software distribution, photo distribution, video distribution, all that cool stuff. Now, block storage, by comparison, is a different type of storage area network. Block storage takes your data and breaks it down into blocks. Now, what's so cool about the block storage environment is block storage works really well with environments where the, the, object, the files change frequently. So with, with object storage, every time you create a new file or modify a file, it creates a version. Not so with block storage. So the answer is as follows. Block storage looks and feels like a regular storage area network environment. Object storage does not. Computers can use block storage because it feels like a local hard drive, even though it's not. Block storage often has better performance than object storage, by the way it's structured, but not necessarily. Block storage is typically more expensive from a cloud provider because it's much, much more useful than object storage. Object storage is only good for stuff you're distributing. Block storage is used by a system. So block storage used as basically a logical pseudo hard drive in your computer. Whereas object storage is basically a bucket where you're going to dump and store your data and your backups. So that's the difference between block storage and object storage and realistically speaking, how they work. Chris, would you like to bring in the next question? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in the responses that people had to that question so that you can maybe briefly comment about that response. Again, only because it took up so much of the chat conversation. I want to make sure we, we have that. That. Sounds good. And for the folks that are saying, why don't we have slides? Our systems went down. We're on a backup system. We will have slides back up and running tomorrow. We had them for the first two thirds and we have a little technical questions. So, so these, I'm going to bring these up and just, like I said, just, you know, 15, 20 second uh, follow through on, on what this person said. Just okay. all of them were good, good, good meaning, I'm sure. So I just want to make sure we're all this, get the right answers across. So here's yeah, because the there's lot, lot, lots of things like block storage is also non-volatile, just like object storage is non-volatile. Yeah, so we'll just go through them. There's several sure. of them. 
Block storage is used anytime you have files that need to change or needs to be mounted locally by a server. Um, so block storage is used for everything, not just databases. If you've got a server that's sitting in your computer on the cloud, you're going to be using block storage because it's the only thing that's not going to go away with reboot. So block storage is used for everything that's going to be mounted to a server if you need a local hard drive. If you need multiple servers to be using the same data at a time, you're going to be using file storage. So there, that's your that's exactly when you would use it. Okay, Chris, you want to bring up the next one? Object storage is for is for objects that are typically writ, writ, write read once, uh, write once, read many times. So you're typically using it for software distribution, photos, videos, and backups. Object storage is also used in data lake environments because of the metadata or the data about the data. Okay, great. I'll bring up the next one. Um, it really has nothing to do with granularity. Um, object storage has a tremendous amount of data, that metadata about it. Block storage does not have it, but uh, so you can do more, more cool things with that extra metadata, Nathan. But it's not that it's necessarily more granular. It's you could look at that metadata and do something cool about it. Jawad, kind of perfect. Jawad's one of my students. Block storage is used for constant reads and writes. Object storage is used for static content that doesn't have a lot of writes. Exactly, Jawad. Chris, is there another one? I don't think it's that one storage environment is more scalable than the other, Nathan. Nathan, um, they're both they're both storage area network technologies, meaning they're both environments, a bunch of hard hard drives and RAID arrays. It's not that one scales better. Now, object storage is uh, for static and is typically cheap. Block storage is super scalable, some of the most scalable in the world. And why the block storage is so scalable is that you can store your data, any, any, any of your data, wherever it needs to be in the storage environment. So because of that decoupling of the storage environment, block storage is super scalable. But so is object storage. Exactly, Joaj. Block storage can be attached and it feels like a local hard drive. Object storage is accessed basically via a website or via storage gateway or something because computers can't directly access object storage. AWS charges you when you retrieve your data, but also when you send your data across regions and everything else. If so, okay, so no, Michael, when you're using object storage or S3, you pay for every megabit or gigabit that you actually store. So the price that you pay for infrequent access is basically half of what you would store it regularly. So traditional S3, you pay a fee to serve your data, but you don't pay to retrieve your data locally inside. Now, if you're retrieving it in between regions, there's data transfer charges, the answer is yes. But to retrieve your data locally, you are actually not charged. Now, if it's egressing your systems, you're going to pay to pull it off. So the answer is yes. But if you're using infrequent access, you'll pay to get it out of infrequent access, and then you'll get and you'll pay to actually get it off of the AWS network. So this is paying once, Michael, versus paying the twice with infrequent access. Block storage is typically costlier in the cloud environment. Block storage and object storage in the data center are typically the same price. It's marketing in the way they choose to charge you. Okay, so here's what's going on, Mohit. You have the opportunity in the cloud to basically pay for performance of your block storage. Realize this, regardless of what anybody says, block storage is relatively low performance, really low performance. And we'll talk about the performance of block storage in terms of throughput and in terms of IOPS. I want you all to know that for $100 at the local retailer store, you can buy a Samsung 980 Pro, like a half a terabyte that will give you 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 megabit per second read write speed and a half a million IOPS. So on the cloud, a high performance EBS volume, a provision IOPS volume is 64,000 IOPS. So realistically speaking, you can get 10 times the speed in the performance for $100 one time at Best Buy or 
um, Amazon or Fry's or any computing stores. So lock storage, while we'll talk about it in the cloud being high context of high performance, realize it is really slow compared to what we would actually do in the data center. So what's going on with the cloud is basically you can provision your services ahead of time. And by provisioning, you can say, I need a certain number of input and output operations per second, as well as a certain amount of throughput megabit per second is traversing through the storage environment. And realistically speaking, I wish it wasn't the case, but you pay for the throughput that you actually use and you pay for the volume. So when you pay to buy a provisioned IOP as volume inside of the cloud, you can't just get the speed you need. There's a limitation of the speed related to the actual size of your volume. So we'll talk about this more later. It, there's a 30 or a 50 times ratio, depending upon the year and the cloud provider of how much um, you can actually do with regards to IOPS. So you might need, you know, a million IOPS and you can't do that on 128 gig biome in the cloud. You might need a 30 terabit provision IOPS biome in the cloud to do that or multiple th big ones that are going to actually be strung together in RAID. So yes, completely agree with you. On um, block storage, if you pay for provision and you have to pay for a bigger storage than you actually need because you need a certain amount of input op output operations per second, you are going to pay more. So hope that kind of made sense for you. Chris, if you'd like to bring up the next question. Yeah. Doreen, what is the recommended life cycle management pattern? Okay. Doreen, it's 100% based upon your customer's data use pattern. I know in Amazon, they always give you these silly examples. We access our data frequently for 30 days, infrequently for 30 days, and by 90 days, we don't use them anymore. But this is really, really dependent on the industry. There are industries that are going to use the same data every day for 10 years straight. They can't come up with a life cycle apology because it would be bad for them. There are other organizations that use their data actively for three days, and then that data is old and expired, so they could go from straight from three days in S3 directly over to infrequent access, and they may never need it again after 10 days, and they can send it all to Glacier. So realistically, the architect is not like an engineer. That architect is really going to have to go meet with that client and really figure out the client's business, really learn what the client's needs are, really look at what the client's business is, how the business operates, their business challenges, their pain plans, their growth desires. And it's up to you, the architect, to look at all the technology solutions you have to come up with an end-to-end -end systems design to do this for them. So that's for you, the architect, as a cloud architect. Remember, as cloud architects, we don't configure, we don't code, we design these big end-to-end -end systems. As cloud engineers, we build them. So really depends on where you're actually gonna cool. be along the way. I am, oh, very cool. Did you find uh, slides for me? Yeah, so if you want, we can. you can tell me a section and just tell me when to show a slide and I can, manually do that. I'm loving this. This is awesome. This is teamwork across the cloud. Yeah. So uh, let me I love it. Let me look through these questions real fast before we uh... see if there's any more questions. Um, thank you for bearing us with our technology challenges. Everybody's got them. Avery P, can you think of those pointers like hard links and soft links in Linux? Exactly, Avery P. Um, you know, in Linux, you've got a pointer to data. When you're dealing with object storage, you've got a point for the data. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, All right. How about EFS? We'll talk about EFS when we talk about network file storage. EFS, or Elastic File System, is the Amazon branded name of Sun Microsystems Oracle's network file system. So we'll talk about EFS, which is what multiple servers would use to mount user data, and that would be EFS. Now, if we're dealing with Windows computers, Windows computers don't actually map to NFS drives. They map to server message block protocol, which is realistically speaking gonna be EFSX on Amazon, and we'll talk about that. Now, EBS is what you're gonna use, which is block storage, which is what you're gonna use as a local hard drive for a server, and we'll talk much more about that under computing, and now that you know what that is, S3 is object storage, which is where you're going to store your software things that are going to read once, write many. So we'll get in much more details when we start talking about how the pieces and parts fit together. So realistically speaking, 
Let's so, now. Yes, Chris. Uh, do you want to tell me what slide number you're going to start on? I know you're working off your notebook. Um, so yeah. So for right now, I am on slide 66. Don't share it yet. I'll tell nope. you when to share it. And just tell me what's not what slide number to share when you're ready. Okay, so let's talk about encrypting your data on S3. I want you to think of what is encryption. Encryption takes what you have and it makes it unusable to everyone else who does not have a decryption key. So let's look at it this way. If I wanted to speak to my wife, simple encryption, and I spoke to her in Greek, people that did not speak Greek or have the Greek decryption key did not understand it. So in its essence, in early cryptography, it's just speaking another language. Look at cool languages that were designed that people didn't know. Patois, for example, in the Caribbean. It was to be a language that no one does not know, kind of encryption. Yiddish was another language. Again, something that people weren't supposed to know. So it's a form of encryption. But here, when we're talking about storage, we're talking about protecting sensitive data. And there's two ways we can do it. We can encrypt the data before we send it to storage, or we can take the data that's stored and we can encrypt it when it's stored or on the way to storage. So we're going to talk about client-side encryption and customer-side encryption. So Chris, if you could share slide 67 for me. So in this particular environment, the first type of encryption we're going to talk about is the SSE-KMS. This is if the customer wants to manage their keys and they want to use an automated key management system. So it's a really special environment. You're going to have complete control over the keys. You manage your master key with this key management system, and the key management system from AWS will manage the data key, and it's really elegant. You just manage your key. They manage all the data keys. And the key management system will provide an audit trail of how who and when your data was accessed. So I love this. You manage the key and the uh, key management system uh, takes care of all the work for you. So this is really a simple and elegant solution. Chris, if you'd like to move on to slide 68. Now in this particular environment, we have the SSE-S3. So this is where AWS is gonna manage the keys for you, all of it. So basically you use them as a key management solution. AWS is going to manage your keys. They're going to rotate your keys. And every time you encrypt an object, guess what? It's going to have a unique encryption key. So I want you to really think about this. If you are able to, in your organization, entrust AWS or someone else, if you're able to do that, to manage the keys of your environment and automatically rotate them and encrypt every object with a new encryption key, you've got incredible security. But here is the question. Can you? And the question is, can you? And in most cases, you cannot. Can you actually allow the customer, meaning or the service with the provider, AWS, to manage your encryption keys? In many environments that are high secure, the customer must maintain integrity of their own encryption keys and manage it. So we talked about the customer management keys with the AWS system first. Now we're talking about SSE-S3, which is where AWS has a complete, complete component of the key management system. So now, and we're going to have a lot more S3 labs coming up in this section, obviously, because um, this is something that's pretty important to what a cloud engineer would do is to really get their hands dirty with S S3. So we're going to have some more S3 labs and object storage labs and storage labs. And now let's look at an environment that's really secure. Let's say you're dealing with the military. Let's say you're dealing with the munitions manufacturer. Let's say you're dealing with a bank, for example, and they say we need the strongest, most robust security solution we can do. This is where the customer maintains autonomy over everything. So basically, realistically speaking, the customer has complete autonomy over their encryption keys. They manage all the keys, but they're using the SSE-D, customer provided keys, complete management system. The customer maintains it all. Now, you know, there's other environments as well. So basically that's realistically speaking, you know, how we're doing this, these are your encryption forms. So let's talk about S3 and optimizing performance. Chris, you can put me front and center screen again. So let's talk about things that we can do to improve the performance of the object storage on AWS. Now there's a couple of things we're gonna talk about. 
We're going to talk about something called pre-signed URLs and why they're beneficial. We'll talk about multi-part uploads, and boy, they're cool and very beneficial. Then we'll talk about range gets, and I think that's one of the coolest things of object storage. And then we'll talk about cross-region replication and why organizations might want to do this. So let's begin first with pre-signed URLs. When you stick your data into AWS and S3, it's private, meaning others can't access it. This is a good thing. You don't want your data accessed by the world automatically. So if you want people to access your data, you have to enable access. So there's lots of ways you can do it. You create an IAM user and a policy and give them an authentic ability to authenticate and you're authorized to access your data. But you could do other cool stuff too. So what if I could basically take my object and I can pre-sign sign it, send you a pre-signed link to that, and all you had to do was click the link and see the file for as long as I wanted you to have it, and then after that, you couldn't do it again. Pretty cool, huh? I use my encryption key. I sign the object, and then I send it to you, and I just give you a look. Click here to download, and it works. And you know what happens a week later? It's not there anymore. You won. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So now you kind of get the concept. So you can create a pre-signed URL, which will basically do this. Now, Chris, if you would share slide 62, please. 72. 72, please. So when you create a pre-signed URL, basically what's happening is you're signing it with your keys, and then someone else will just be able to use it. So the method that you use to sign the uh, URL will determine its expiration. So if I sign it with an IAM instance profile, that expiration time can't last longer than six hours. So why? It's not considered the most secure environment. Now by comparison, if I use the AWS security token service, which is basically a one-time password, and that's pretty cool, our things can last up to 36 hours because it's deemed more secure. Now, if I use an IAM user and create a link to another IAM user, this is strong because it's a strong encryption. The user is already authorized, so they get up to seven days to access this content. And, you know, realistically speaking, after that, if we if we use a temporary token, it's realistically speaking, um, basically when the token expires. So you can almost think of a, a pre-signed URL as how long you can access a video on Netflix. Because Netflix is predominantly served from S3 if you're authenticated. So now, Chris, if you want to bring me front and center again. So let's talk about S3 and object storage. So I want you to think about what happens when you transfer a file. When you're transferring files reliably, you're going to use TCP, which basically means it's going to be like this. I'm going to send a file to Alonzo. Alonzo is going to say, yep, Mike, I got it. I'm going to send Alonzo two, two pieces of data. Alonzo is going to say, I got it. I'm going to send Alonzo four pieces of data. He's going to say, I got it. I'm going to send him eight. And then when Alonzo doesn't say, I got it, Mike, I'm going to start retransmitting from the beginning and end. In TCP, this is called the sliding window. It enables flow control over a network. Now, what happens if I want to send a five gig file to Alonzo? And 4.8 gigs get through, and the last part is dropped off. Alonzo effectively has nothing. He can't reconstitute the data that I gave him. So obviously, this is not a good environment. So I have the opportunity to break the file that I send to Alonzo into a bunch of little files. Then let's say instead of 5 gigs, I have something that are 30 megs each or 100 megs each. And I send Alonzo a bunch of file parts in order. I send Alonzo part 1, part 2, part 3, part 4, part 5, part 99, part 5,000. Alonzo receives them and says, yes, I've got all the parts, puts back together in a single file, and it's good. That's called a multi-part upload. So, Chris, if you'll bring up slide 74 in a multi-part upload, what you're going to do when Chris brings up slide 75 is you're going to take a file, you're going to split it into multiple pieces, and then it'll be reconstituted there. So think about this logically. If one part of that file is lost, you don't send the whole file. Again, you send that one part that was lost. So this is really cool. So it increases your speed because you can thread it in multiple threads. You increases your scalability because you don't have to worry about sending most of your data and losing some along the way. It enables you to reliably send large amounts of data to large customers. Here, 
to an environment all across the environment. So let's do this. Let's talk about cross-region replication. Chris, if you want to bring up the next slide. So with AWS, when you're dealing with AWS, they charge you every time you send your data to different reasons. So let's say I want to keep my data in the US and I want to keep data in Greece or somewhere in Europe. I start a website, it's in Greek. I speak Greek at home, I think in Greek. So I can basically set up my website here and I've got something else coming out of Europe in another AWS region, great. I've got to get my data from, port, from point P. So I can use cross-region replication and it will copy the bucket I have, the data that I have in one region to another. Why would I do this? A couple of reasons. Full redundancy. If everything I have in New York is copied in San Francisco and New York goes down, I'm covered. But why else? AWS charges you for transferring your data. Every time you transfer between regions, they charge you. So let's say I've got a website that gets a million hits a day out of Europe. And it's all hosted out of Ohio. Every time somebody hits my static website hosted in S3, they're going to be charged inter-region transfer charges. If I get a million hits a day, I'm going to be charged a million times per day for someone accessing my web page from the US. By comparison, if I just copied my bucket and served my website locally out of Europe and copied it there, I would only have to pay for the replication of my data as opposed to every single million web hit that I get per day. I hope that makes sense to everyone. The cross-region replication does the following. It enables you to take your data from one place and copy it to another location to keep your data synchronized in real time. That is the region of cross-region replication. Takes your data, synchronizes it in real time across another region, saves interdepartmental regional transfer charges, gives you a backup copy in another environment in case anything were to go wrong. So let's do this. Before we get into instant storage on all the other cool storage platforms, which we will cover tomorrow, and Alonzo will do some really cool storage labs with you tomorrow, there's three minutes left of the allocated time. So if anybody has any last minute questions, let me answer them. I will say this, if you're enjoying the content, please leave a like and type cloud architect in the window. So we know that you're here and paying attention. So on a kit, you're, there's, uh, if you're using AWS organizations, which is way above the Certified Solution Architect Associate, that's one of the bigger contents on the Certified Solution Architect Professional, you can do lots of hierarchy um, in organizations, you can also do the following. You can also create lots of VPC pairing and things like that. So lots of different ways you can do that on a kit, but generally speaking, um, there's some good hierarchy you can put in, even if you have to manually do it in backdoor via many other ways. Chris, if you'd like to bring up the next question. Yeah, yeah there's lots of cloud architects in the way, so give me a second. <laughs> I love when I see a million and one cloud architects there. Give you some time to find it. They, they keep moving on me. I see one question is, does cross-region replication save money? Cross-region replication could cost money, a lot of money, for example, if there's if you don't have any interdepartmental region, inter region charges, but it can save a tremendous amount of money if there's a tremendous amount of inter-region transfers. So like anything else on the cloud, or at the data center, it's based upon exactly how your systems are used. The data center could be half the cost of the cloud. The cloud could be half the cost of the data center. It's all based upon your use cases. So does cross-region replication save money? Often it does. If your use case is lots of inter-region transfers for small amounts of data that you could just replicate the bucket, it can save a lot of money. But it can also cost money if an organization doesn't use additional reefs, doesn't do a lot of inter-region transfers. So it's really dependent upon that. If there's any other questions. So when you would use cross room over cloud front end caching. So you've got to do a, do a real um, question and answer to figure out what makes sense. If I had a website that only did Greece and another one that only did Florida, it would probably be cheaper to have two S3 buckets. Now, if for example, um, I had an international website across all parts of the world, it would probably be cheaper to use CloudFront. So it's a matter of using the right thing at the right time for the right purpose for as the dev.
Is cross-region replication appropriate for disaster recovery? It is one of the ways an organization can replicate their data and part of a good disaster recovery strategy, yes, but only part of it. We'll talk more about disaster recovery. Minash Agraro, there are tons of reading materials available on AAWS. Please, can you guide me on some quick content? Start with reading in terms of the material. Well, I don't know what you want to do in your career. And what I would guide you to read is completely different if you want to be a cloud architect versus a cloud engineer. A sysops person needs a very different skill set than an architect. A DevOps person needs a completely different skill set than an architect. A cloud engineer needs a different skill set than an architect. So if you tell me what your goal career is, I'm happy to answer that. But you know, I want to make sure I point you to the right materials. 90% of the problems cloud architects have when they get hired are one of the three things. They either know everybody else's job other than their own. That's most common. OK, you said to be an architect. So to be an architect, really what you need to know, Manesh, it's not the AWS stuff. It's the network and the data center. So I very frequently take people that have passed the certified solutions architect professional, people that have taken these multi-thousand dollar cloud computing training programs, and then I teach them how to be an architect. Here's what you need to know, Manesh, to be an architect. You need to know the network and the data center. Everything you do as an architect is take the systems from the network and the data center and move them to the cloud. So if you don't know what they are, you'll never be able to do the job. So none of that's covered in certification training. That's called, that's why we have a cloud hired and a cloud architect career development program. So the network and the data center. This means BGP, VLANs, 802.1Q tagging, NAT, OSPF, and intermediate systems to intermediate systems, QoS, private VLANs, traffic engineering, routing protocols, firewalls, load balancers, just to name a few. Deep knowledge of block storage, object storage. As a cloud architect, we can have a five-day conversation with someone on their object storage needs. So we've got to have some depth there. We've got to have knowledge of firewalls, IDS, IPS systems, knowledge of all kinds of servers, knowledge of all kinds of containers, container orchestration, knowledge of, of you know, leading large teams. We need a tremendous amount of business acumen, a tremendous amount of emotional intelligence, a tremendous amount of executive presence, communication skills, ROI modeling. These, Miguel Manash, are cloud architect skills. So far more and more important to know them than just the AWS services. The AWS services are part of it, but really we're talking about end-to-end -end systems design. So there's really that. The next question, you're a developer but not good at coding. Can you be a cloud architect? Cloud architects do not code. Cloud architects do not configure. Alonzo is a cloud architect, but he's got great cloud engineering skills, and that's why I'm using him to configure things. We cloud architects are design, 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 design some more at an executive level, and that's all we do. We do not code. We do not configure. We do not build. If we've got a proof of concept, we have cloud engineers that are doing it. If we've got a bunch of containers to be deployed, we've got a development engineer. Here's the process. I'm a cloud architect. I meet with the client. I ask the right questions. I baseline their systems. I come up with a design. I present that design to the customer. I convince that customer they need it. After I designed it, I hand it to cloud engineers. They go build it. And when it's completely built, they hand it to the maintenance people or the sysop people that maintain it. That's our process. And it's always that way. So if you want to be a cloud architect, you want to get a great cloud architect job, don't learn to code, don't learn to script, don't learn sysops, don't learn DevOps, learn cloud architecture. You want to be a DevOps professional, learn DevOps engineering. You want to be a doctor, study medicine. You want to be a veterinarian, study veterinary medicine. Study and be an expert at your job, the one you want, and you will always get hired. So I hope I answered your question there. Okay, uh, Addy, um, um, and... Uh, so nice to have you here. I know exactly where you're from. I actually have four Addy students over the years and about five IOs, which is really, really cool. So here's what I strongly recommend for the exam. We, this course, are relatively comprehensive, but we are focusing more on the skills to get you higher than just pure certification. We all, but you know, we cover the certification materials pretty deeply here in addition to the actual real life materials. So next. We have a completely free AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate book. 25,000 plus people have read that book. I get letters every day that someone has passed their exam for free. So in addition to this free course, 
and that free book, we also have another free AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate course here. Link is in the description below. You can watch that. That is a very fast, efficient course. And then, you know who I recommend for certification exams? Andrew Brown from ExamPro. Andrew Brown's free training is a million times better than those other paid certification courses we've had out there. Mine is about how to get cloud hired. His is about how to get cloud certified. Combine the two, mix it with my book, and for free, you have absolutely everything you need. I then recommend you get a practice exam. There's a gentleman named Haman Sharma. He's a CEO. He's a friend of mine. He owns. He's the CEO of Review and Prep. He's got some exceptionally good practice exams for the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate. So those are what I recommend that you do to pass the exam. My training here will actually teach you cloud architecture. We've got a blog that has everything you'd ever want to know. We've got a tremendous amount of videos that you can use for your professional development. And if you really want to get a cloud architect job, you can look to our Cloud Architect Career Development Program, which is a 16-week, 250-hour program to create cloud architects, assuming you've worked in tech before. And if you haven't worked in tech, it's a 500-hour deep training program. You can see what we've covered in two and a half hours. You can imagine what we do in 500 plus hours. So but give you that kind of concept. So we're really about being great at it. So I hope I answered your question there, Addy. You know what? On Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock Eastern time, 2 p.m. UK time, I am going to do a completely free three-hour session. You can ask me any questions or two-hour sessions, and after that, we'll have class. On Thursday, I'm going to hold our at 9 a.m. Uh, how to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar, and I will tell you everything you need to know. So I want you to know it. And on Friday, I'm going to bring in two of the best recruiters that I've met in 20 years. They placed me on two of the five jobs I've interviewed for in my life, and I've been hired by all five that I interviewed for. They've placed more students of mine over the last two decades in great jobs on Wall Street at big tech companies than I can count. So, you know, super important. And that's going to be Friday at 9 a.m. So, hope does anybody have any more questions? I know I'll be re-imaging my system after this before the 5 o'clock meeting. At 5.30 tonight, we are going to discuss BGP. BGP is my favorite thing in the entire world. I have designed BGP architectures for almost every major service provider in the world and every global you know, person that's using BGP, which is thousands of places. I've spent BGP. Alonzo and I have had four-hour BGP discussions at 10 o'clock at night, often because Alonzo is such a great cloud architect and he knows how important it is. My students are even getting asked BGP questions on cloud architect interviews and they're passing them. So you need to know BGP. So you know what I'm doing tonight? 5.30, we're discussing BGP. Now, I've got lots of BGP videos out there. Facebook had a meltdown. It cost them $7 billion because they didn't know BGP. Somebody there made a configuration error. Now, think about this. $7 billion because of a BGP error. Now, how many $300,000 CCIEs could you pay for that? Thousands, thousands, and thousands. No big deal. So organizations do not mind paying handsomely for a great cloud architect. They can't afford the downtime. So be great. We're coming to talk about BGP. Tomorrow, my systems will be up. We will have no technical challenges sharing slides. Alonzo is going to do some more demos. So thank you for attending. Alonzo, would you have anything to say to the group? Uh, definitely. Um, I just want to say again, it's so wonderful to be able to, to perform and to be able to um, share a lot of the knowledge and, and a lot of the screens that I've done so far. And I will definitely be sharing a lot more. Uh, over the next coming days. So thank you so much for attending our, our class today. Lonzo, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You know, we cloud architects don't configure, we design. So I know you had to pull back on your cloud engineering skills to do the basic engineering for the folks on this call to help people. So thank you, Alonzo Coleman, for helping others. Let's give a round of applause for Alonzo coming in to volunteer to help coach for you. Um, He's not part of our company, like he's not an employee, so he's not doing this for work. He's doing this as a favor to help you out there. Alonzo Coleman, thank you. Fantastic Cloud Architect. Thank if you, you guys thank can you. leave a like, a comment, share this with others, and if you've had a good time, type hashtag Cloud Hired. We know it's going to be a great time. Again, tonight, 5.30 p.m., we're going to cover BGP, and it's real timely after this, so... Tomorrow at 9 a.m., what are we doing? 9 a.m., we're doing question and answers for your career tomorrow. Love to see you all here. And uh, after that, we're going to do more cloud training. And Thursday, we're going to have a Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar. And 
Yes, absolutely. Um, for people that are looking for cloud architect training, you can reach our office at this number. It's a totally dangerous thing to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. We truly care so much about people having the best cloud architect careers. I've literally put our company phone number in a YouTube window. So, you know, and I will actually own that phone for the next week. Next week, it'll go to my chief operating officer, Chris. The week after that, it'll go to another one of my executives. So, you know, I'll have it today. And I'm not going to be saying I'm great at returning phone calls today because I'll be re-imaging a computer. But if anybody calls me this week, they will get a call back within the next few days. So thank you all for attending. Alonzo, I'm really grateful for your help. For those of you that are all over the world right now, I am so thankful to have you here. I mean, wow, I'm looking at some of these names and I know where some of you guys are. I'm just so happy. I know the countries that I've seen people from. I mean, I'm just so thrilled that we can reach out to so many wonderful people. Um, Jamie, thanks. Thank you so much for everyone, for wherever you are. I really appreciate the time that you took to come here, spend your time, your night, your days, so that we can help in any way possible. Thank you. Thank you. Anything we can do to help you, we're going to do. We will be back tomorrow. I will be having a party. Anytime I can connect with the Cloud Architect community, where do you download our ebook? You download our ebook and the description of every single video we have. There'll be a link to our free book. You can get the book. Here's what happens. You'll fill in the form. You'll get an email. It will include a link to it. It may take upwards of 15 minutes to get the email, though, just so you know. Finland, that's kind of a cool one. I think Ian's in Sweden. Uh, the UK, I know we've got lots of people. I've uh, seen a tremendous number of people that we know that are in Cameroon, which is really awesome. Um, lots of people in Nigeria, South African names that I've seen on this call. I've seen a lot of India names that I know for people in India. Lots of people in Pakistan, Ethiopia. You can call me Mikey as well for the remainder of this. I'm so happy to have you there. Um, wonderful. Um, Chintan's over in India, I believe. I remember. Mayer, so welcome. Leo, you're in South America. Thank you. So nice to have you all here. So wonderful. And it's also so, awesome. This is such a global community coming here together so that we can learn. So just stay here and enjoy and just take on the, the experience of, of learning together globally. Now, Zima's from Ethiopia as well. You know what? I need some kiftu um, and some spice lentils. I actually have a fair amount of sparrow and Burberry downstairs. If I have the time, I'm actually going to cook some great Ethiopian foods. Uruguay, wow, wonderful. Isn't this so wonderful? Spain, that Virginia. Cool. I mean, this is just, it, it's a blessing that we can get a Nigerian based in Scotland. I mean, this oh, is just awesome. great. Greetings from Spain, 20 years in telecom. You know, 20 years in telecom is fantastic. We will have so much more. See you all at 5.30. Um, we love you, Samir. Um, Samir is a good friend and a student, a great cloud architect in Australia. Heidi from Germany. Wow, this is just, it's just so wonderful. Um, Evo's in Hungary. Oh, wow, Em, you're in Kenya. This is really just awesome. Derek, see you at 5.30. Indonesia. Wow. So happy to see you all. Can't wait to see you all tomorrow. Alonzo and I will be back. And uh, I actually do find myself a lot in the Ethiopian community. So I would love to meet you uh, down there. Mm -hmm. I spend a tremendous amount of time with some very close Ethiopian friends. Um, Yumag, you know, also wonderful, also in India. Um, Kieran, wonderful having you here. Jesse, see you at 5.30. Also, um, Jesse. And Ahmad, always great to see you. So, Jeezy, awesome. Thank you for your kind words about Alonzo. Thank you so much, Greg. Have a great night, everybody. I will see you all tomorrow, and I look forward to seeing you. Actually, I'll see you all tonight on BGP if you yeah. want. And guess what? Uh, 5.30 is Eastern Standard Time, so 5.30 Eastern Standard Time is 10.30 UK time, 2.30 Pacific time, and uh, 11.30 Central European time. So I think in South Africa, Nigeria, it'll be 10.30, and I'm pretty sure um, in, in uh, like the Central European areas like Cameroon, I think that's when it becomes... Uh, Central European time, 6.30, but I could be wrong um, because I talk to more people in more countries in a day than I can imagine, which is really the coolest thing ever, and I never even know which time zone I'm in. So thank you for subscribing. Uh, please subscribe. Please share with friends and others. Thank you all. See you all tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Later.